Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Luis Davidovich. I'm president of the Brazilian Academy of Science. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you here. And I'd like also to thank the Brazilian Bank for, uh, National Bank for the Economic and Social Development for kindly uh, letting us use this fantastic space. Uh, you have uh, seen a movie about what uh, this bank does. It was in Portuguese, but lots of pictures, so you might, uh, those who don't know Portuguese might have a good idea of that. And it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, the uh, uh, keynote speaker uh, of this morning, uh, Muhammad uh, Hassan, who happens to be also the president of TUAS, TUAS is the World Academy of Sciences for the development of science in the, in the developing world. And uh, he uh, has been involved with TUAS for a long, long time, and he's now president of TUAS. So uh, please, Mohammed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Louise, and uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to participate in this uh, magnificent uh, uh, conference. I'm really delighted to be here. And good morning, everybody. I hope you are all uh, feeling uh, uh, comfortable this morning. Um, so I plan to speak for roughly about 40 minutes uh, to allow more time for questions and comments and discussion. I would like it to be more sort of interactive rather than just going on for an hour. Um, giving a presentation. So, uh, can I have my presentation, please? Okay, so this is the uh, title of the presentation, and I have four uh, issues I would like to very quickly go through. Uh, you can see that they are all global, um, although I come from Africa, but I like to think also globally sometimes. Uh, so I will talk about the global sustainability challenges. Um, we've heard most uh, of um, the, the many of the sessions yesterday and the day before talking about sustainability challenges. Uh, but I will talk also about the global agreements uh, that uh, really respond uh, to the global sustainability challenges because they are very important uh, for us. And then, of course, the, the, the global science, technology, and innovation how it how it works globally um, and who is controlling uh, the science and technology more than the the others and then i will talk uh, about the partnership and this is really where i would like to give some specific recommendations how to move forward with all this okay so let's get this started the global sustainability challenges um many of you know that it all started in the year 2002 at the rio plus 10 uh, when the the huge meeting in uh, south africa um, uh, uh, was on the sustainability issues and the global challenges. And there they identified water, energy, health, agriculture, and biodiversity as the major uh, sustainability challenges. But let alone after 10 years uh, with the meeting that was held here, Rio plus 20, they added a number of very critical issues also. So they, uh, sorry. Okay, so they added, uh, they added the cities, the disasters, the peace, inequalities, education, and jobs. These are real challenges now, uh, as, as we see. And, it, and all of this, of course, ended up in the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, but the two extremely important and um, cross-cutting problems, and one of them is what we are discussing here, the poverty, and the other one is the climate change, and they are linked. So these have been identified as overarching uh, critical uh, problems. Um, yesterday we heard a lot about how severe these problems are in Africa, yesterday and the day before. And I don't want to continue with this one for a, a long time, but I would like just to highlight uh, that uh, uh, in, 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 in Africa, uh, there is a serious problem of poverty, of course. This is the issue that we, we are discussing uh, here in this meeting. 70% of Africans live on less than $2 a day. 
And then the malnutrition. The malnutrition, of course, with all its uh, components, undernutrition, a shortage of food, and then the micronutrients. This is very important, uh, the deficiency in micronutrients, and then the obesity. I, in Africa, we are also beginning to see obesity as well, people eating the wrong food. So it's becoming fat and obese, and this is also a problem, a health problem. Energy, 60% of Africans do not have electricity, and then water, 40% of Africans have no access to safe drinking water. And then, of course, the climate change and the environment, the drought, the deforestation, that was also mentioned yesterday, and, uh, and then the rapid population growth and the youth bulge. This is, again, a, a problem, but as we heard yesterday, it could also, it could also be an opportunity for, for Africa and the rest of the world to benefit from the, uh, from the use of Africa. Uh, Africa has 1.2 billion people, and 60% of them are under 25. Well, climate change, as I said, is a big problem in Africa uh, because the continent is, is, is very vulnerable to climate change because it has very weak uh, and fragile ecosystem. And of course, more importantly, is the adaptation capacity. I think Africa has the weakest adaptation capacity when it comes to climate change. And uh, we know that climate change uh, increases the drought, the heat stress, the floods, and the food insecurity, they're all related. And uh, the global warming uh, increases the sand and dust movement in Africa's dry lands. This is a, a very uh, uh, visible picture, which an image which was provided by NASA in July 2018, and it just shows how, how dust uh, is being uh, carried out by the wind and transported to large distances. In fact, um, uh, NOAA uh, called the African dust uh, the new carbon dioxide. Uh, and um, they found that it is the dust, the African dust is actually warming, warming the Atlantic, which is a, an extremely disturbing uh, 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 phenomenon. But what is interesting is that this, this is a very recent study uh, by NASA again, and um, it indicated that um, around about 108 million tons of dust are transported every year from African Sahara, and mainly from Lake Chad. The, uh, Lake Chad is now, as uh, you know, it's dry. Uh, so this dust uh, is really um, transported in, a, in big quantities, 182 million. Uh, transported every year, and 27 million is deposited in the Amazon bas basin, including 22,000 tons of phosphorus. As you know, the Amazon, as well, we heard yesterday, is very deficient in, in, in phosphate. But this is transported, and it is, it, it, it is, it is deposited here, and it is what is uh, making the Amazon forest uh, green. Uh, that has been studied, and it, it has been shown that due to this Sahara dust that's transported uh, from Lake Chad uh, with these nutrients, uh, the, the Amazon forest is really benefiting from that. Uh, this is a huge quantity of dust, but Africa is giving it free to Brazil. Uh, so it's a gift, an annual gift from Africa to Brazil, and we are very happy about that. Okay, let me now talk about the the global agreements. Well, um, of course, the uh, very famous agreement uh, that was reached in the year 2015, and, um, and that is the Sustainable Development Goals, of course. We, we talked about this yesterday and day before yesterday, but I really would like to highlight uh, two important issues here, uh, which I, what I'm really going to deal with in the rest of my talk, that is science and technology and innovation and the partnership. And in my view, these are really key means of implementation, means of implementation, and as uh, indicated in the SDGs 9 and 17. And the second is that agriculture is really central, central to all SDGs, and in particular SDGs 1, that deals with uh, poverty, and 2, that deals with hunger, and then 3. Uh, and uh, climate action, of course, is SDG 13, as we said earlier, is very, very essential for all the SDGs. Well, the same year, 
uh, of course, you, you see here the, uh, uh, the climate agreement, uh, and that, that, that I mean, you know, the year 2015 for global, global engagement and global partnership was really a fantastic year. So we had the SDGs, and then we had this fantastic climate agreement that was reached in Paris, and these are the two architects for it. That was really a huge, huge success for the entire world, not just a, a single country or a single zone. But unfortunately, she did not win the race in 2016. Um, and, um, and, and something really, really happened there. And if you want to know more about it, you just read her book, What Happened. Uh, I read it, by the way. It's a very interesting and fascinating book. And then the setback came in 2017. The United States withdrew uh, from the climate uh, agreement. And Al Gore, of course, is very furious because he's one, uh, one of the great supporter of uh, climate change. Uh, uh, so he said, uh, if you want to save the P uh, Paris Agreement, you have to somehow vote him out. Let us hope, let us see if this happens. Okay. There's something very interesting that resulted from that. And, and if there is anything that the world benefited from, by uh, the United States uh, uh, withdrawing from the climate agreement. is this huge mobilization, huge movement, huge march for science, in support of science, in support of uh, scientific evidence, trust scientific facts. Uh, and this march started actually in the year 2016. And every year there is a march. And there are several of them. Uh, but um, in, the, in, the, in the month of April, or may usually they have the, the huge ones in the United States and also in Europe. And now it's spreading everywhere. Uh, what is interesting is that this picture here, these are the, the leaders of various faiths, uh, from Christianity, from Islam, from Judaism, they are also demonstrating and showing their support for science and for evidence-based science. And I think this is really quite a, an important uh, outcome. And uh, here in Brazil, I, I just, found that uh, uh, there was a march for science in April uh, the 5th, 2017 in Sao Paulo. Uh, but that's interesting. I, I like this because the, the it's also dealt with the problems of Brazilian science, wanting the Brazilian government and authorities to pay more attention to science and to support science. And, and I, I don't know whether you know this lady, Natalie Keller, uh, but she wrote a very nice comment about that science has the power to help us find real answers to issues of education, health, urban violence, and sustainable development in Brazil. But science needs our help. In telling Brazilians about it, we are marching to raise awareness. Uh, very nice. And by the way, the young, the youth, the, 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 the sorry, this is the movement uh, that is going to take place uh, on May the 4th, 2019, and this is just an announcement for it. So as I said, this is going to happen every year, and this is the next event. Apparently, the, these people are really organizing um, uh, themselves uh, pretty well, and this is going to be quite a big, a big event everywhere in the world. Uh, but I wanted, I'm very fascinated that the, the young people and the children are getting engaged in this and demonstrating. Look, the look at this guy carrying what? Um, don't mess with our future. Uh, so this is, this, is, this is really a huge movement, and this is good for science. You, know, you have children marching and supporting science, supporting evidence-based science. There's something good. Oh, but I wish that uh, America didn't withdraw from the climate change, but th this outcome actually has, has been good for science. Okay, then the hope came. The hope came in 2019 uh, when the Democrats uh, won the House. And uh, immediately they looked at, um, at, at climate change that they wanted back on the agenda for the Congress. Uh, so the, they organized these hearings. Um, the first one was held in February 2019. And actually one of the scientists who testified was uh, Robert uh, Koh. Robert Cobb is the co-author of the National Climate Assessment that was released in November. Uh, and this, assess this is an assessment that was denied by Trump. Uh, uh, 
and, um, uh, and it's a huge, very comprehensive, very detailed assessment of nearly 200 pages. Uh, it is a data-driven and peer-reviewed assessment, very solid. Uh, and he presented this to the Congress, and one of his comments was that the planet is running a fever. It's not, you know, it's in a very serious situation. But I, going back to 2015, uh, this is an agreement uh, that was reached by a number of countries, a number of heads of governments in, in, in about 20, 20 countries. And um, it's, it's, it's a very interesting agreement. It was initiated by Bill Gates. So it involved governments and it also involved the private sector. Uh, and that agreement was reached with 20 countries and 30 global billionaires led by Bill Gates. Uh, by the way, the, the only African billionaire, Dangote, is also one of, one of those billionaires who signed the agreement. And uh, uh, Canada joined the agreement. Uh, now Canada is one of the 24 members. And what I noticed is that Canada uh, uh, is really very, very serious and very keen to move forward. So they have a plan of doubling the federal clean energy investment in research and development for the next five years. So that, that is really quite a, a, a magnificent uh, decision by the Canadian government. Uh, but I really hope that the, uh, the implementation is going to be there. Uh, this is a problem that I think we, we have to uh, consider when we talk about uh, these disagreements. How effective are they when it comes to real implementation and real action? Okay, well, um, um, another one, um, as I, I, if I go back here, uh, you, these are all the 24 countries, but probably you noticed immediately that there is no African country. And, uh, and the poor countries are really not involved in that. These are mostly the rich countries. Uh, but the, what they really wanted to do, and that's very important, is this, to, this is an initiative to accelerate innovation. They want to put a lot of money into innovation to make renewable energy cheaper and more affordable. That's the whole idea. It's research driven uh, to, to, cut, to bring down the cost of renewable energy. And that's good, that's very good. Uh, but it's continuing. Um, so uh, the poor countries uh, managed to get together also a uh, year after, and that was in Morocco. And uh, there were about 40 countries that have signed a very important agreement uh, and, and according to the agreement, they all agreed, they all agreed that by the year 2050, all the energy that's going to be used by them is going to be derived from renewables. It's a tall order. <laughs> it's, a <coughs> it's not an easy, an easy exercise. It's not an easy decision, but they agreed to do it. So action is very important. But what is really interesting is that there is a country that hosted the meeting, that Morocco, that appears to be on on target. Well, Morocco uh, has this ambitious plan. Uh, the, the ambitious plan, in fact, was worked out well before, well before the, uh, the conference in Morocco. And the plan is th that 42% uh, of energy um, mix derived, should be derived from solar and wind energy. And uh, they appear to be on track. Uh, <coughs> and uh, last year, they reached 35%. Um, and they, 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 they built, they are currently building the world's largest concentrated solar power plant uh, and also Africa's largest wind farm to supply 2,000 megawatt, costing about $4 billion. So this is really an excellent model, an excellent model for, for the other countries that really want to follow this agreement. By the year 2050, they will have all their energy or the electricity provided by renewables. And that's a very, very good example. Another country that oh, is also very much uh, concerned about, about energy and shortage of energy, and they want to also to solve this problem through renewables, is Ethiopia. Um, uh, I'm sure that many of you have heard about the grand uh, Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. Uh, this is a dam that is built uh, right, right at the border of Sudan right at the border of Sudan. And it is really the largest d uh, dam in Africa now. So it will um, 
produced about 6,000 megawatts, uh, costing about $5 billion. And, and what is really interesting is that this money is largely provided by domestic sources. So domestic sources are providing uh, most of this fund, and that's very, very important. But of course, um, uh, Egypt and upstream uh, is not happy about that. It's really going to provide, at least initially, before the lake behind the dam is filled, is going to be some shortage of water in, uh, in, in Egypt. And uh, there is in intense discussion between the Egyptians and the Ethiopians. And, um, and uh, the concerns of Egypt uh, have to be somehow met and an agreement has to be reached. Uh, but what is really important is this electricity that's going to be generated from the dam is certainly going to lift a growing number of Ethiopians uh, out of poverty. That is, that is really important because of the accessibility to energy. And then there are the regional benefits. My country, Sudan, is going to benefit from that because 6,000 um, uh, megawatt uh, is really a huge amount of energy and Ethiopia cannot consume all of it, so they have to export some of it and earn money for that. So the countries that are already in negotiation with Ethiopia is Kenya, Djibouti, and Sudan. Um, and very, very recently, uh, the new prime minister, the new prime minister of Ethiopia, the he he contracted two Chinese companies to complete the construction. Hopefully, the operation will start by the year 2020. All right, so <coughs> now let me move to uh, the global science and technology uh, and innovation landscape, sorry. And here, I, I, I would just uh, like to highlight uh, this uh, incredible uh, changing in the landscape of global science. Um, I was here in Brazil um, between the period uh, 2008, 1981, one, 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 and I think I was here 92 or 93. And that, that was, um, I remember I gave a presentation, but that was something that I found <laughs> in my old notes. Uh, so uh, before 1994, the developing world, all the developing world contributed only 15% to the publications, peer reviewed, international publication, and uh, the North, 85%. Between the year 2003 and 2007, uh, um, the, the North was 74, and the developing countries, 26. Uh, but within the developing countries, I, I just put, highlighted Africa, 1.4%, 1.4%. Uh, in the year 2016, and this is really the latest statistics that we have now, we can find, and it was actually compiled not by UNESCO, not by UNESCO, but by the National Science Foundation. It's, it's quite, quite correct uh, and, and authoritative. Uh, and here you see how things change. Um, this is not clear here, but I can, I can tell you that the, uh, the, the developing world the percentage jumped to 44%, 44%. And the developing, uh, the developed world was um, 60, uh, 60, 64, 66%. And that, that, is, that, is in, that is the latest statistics that we have. Now this is, uh, just to uh, bring it closer, or we'll break it down in terms of countries, you can see the top 12 countries. China is now number one for the first time before the United States. So China is producing more research papers now in all areas of science and technology, more than the United States. This is the first time that that line was crossed. Um, and, but one, of course, disturbing feature is that the, 12, the top 12 countries are producing 70% of the publications in the world, the 12%, the, the 12 countries. And if you move further, you will see that the, the 50 countries, the top 50 countries are producing almost 97%. So the rest of the world is only contributing 3%. And, and this sort of sharp division between countries 
and, and in the production of science, production of knowledge. This is quite disturbing, and I, I, I can't see any way of getting rid of poverty, <laughs> quite frankly, globally, if you do not correct this somehow. So th that is one thing I'm, I'm, I'm going to come back to. Uh, and uh, if you look at the, uh, the, the scientific publications again, and look at Europe and China and the US all together, they produce almost three thirds of the publications. And the least developed countries, these are 48 countries, uh, this is our focus really here in, 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 in to us, is only 0.4%, and Africa is 2%. So, uh, so these, these divisions are really incredible. Uh, and these divisions are also related to the expenditure, the, the way uh, countries spend uh, their, their, uh, their money in research and development. The United States, of course, is, has the largest share, 26%. Uh, of the, the, the cost of uh, research and development, the, the expenditure, uh, which amounted to uh, about, in the year 2015, $2.9 trillion. China, 21%, and the European Union, 20%, so the total for these three uh, is 67%. Now, this is an article that was published in uh, The Economist just um, a, month, a month and a half ago. And I really uh, recommend you all to read it. It's really an interesting article. And the title is, Can China Become a Scientific uh, Superpower? Uh, but what is interesting, this is what I, I just highlighted, you know, starting from 2013, you see the way India, Japan, you see the way China is increasing its publications. And this is where this uh, change has taken place. Of course, the European Union is still far ahead uh, in terms of uh, publications. But what is uh, uh, interesting is that when it comes to frontier knowledge, frontier science and technology, uh, there is some kind of divergence. If you look, for example, at the papers published in CRISPR, you see a huge difference between the United States and China. But if you come to nanotechnology, you see the contribution of China is much larger than any other country. Uh, so in, in the area of biological sciences and biotechnology, the United States is far ahead, but not in areas like nanotechnology and so on. And, uh, and this is the way, again, the expenditure. The expenditure, uh, the R&D expenditure, you see the way that it's working. You see how China is moving ahead. Um, what is interesting, I just want to show you this one, which I got also from The Economist. This is the GDP in China. And you see the, co the strong correlation between the rise and the increase in GDP in China and the increase in research and development. Yeah, just two, the two of them are almost identical, exponential growth. So you increase the research and development budget, you increase the GDP. So I mean, we knew about this, but this is really very clearly illustrated by, by this graph. Okay. So let me now move to the third part of my talk. And this is the Global Partnership in Science, Technology, and Innovation for Poverty Eradication and for Sustainable Development. So I want to talk uh, very briefly about two issues. The first one is um, the developing, deploying, and scaling cutting-edge technologies. And these are related. And the second one is building research, innovation, and entrepreneurship capacity. So let me just handle the first one. not moving. Ah. Okay. Um, yes, no. I don't know what's, ha don't know what's happening. Is <laughs> that is the second one. No, that's, uh, that comes later. Oops. Okay, well, let, let me just continue. I mean, I, mean, I put this because uh, when you talk about partnership, uh, the point I wanted to make is that the, the G20 has a really a special responsibility to lead global partnership for uh, achieving the science and technology and the sustainable development goals. Uh, why is that? Uh, you know, this is um, uh, uh, countries that really have 
65% of the population of the world, but they also emit 75% of uh, harmful gases, and they control 90% of the global economy and the 90% of global research. So it's really a very powerful group. And the second interesting feature about it is that there are several developing countries in this group. So it's not just uh, purely the OECD countries. And uh, th those countries are highlighted uh, here in this table. Um, so an action by the G20 in favor of SDGs and implementation of SDGs is extremely crucial and very important. Um, uh, at a meeting they had in China in the year 2016, um, they drafted an implementation strategy for the SDGs, implementation strategy. And in that strategy, they specifically wanted to promote global partnership for uh, capacity building in developing countries. And they talked about uh, North-South, South-South, and also triangular cooperation. Uh, that is very, very clearly specified in this agreement. Um, one would hope that this is going to be implemented, but uh, that was uh, followed by two meetings. Uh, the last one was uh, held in Argentina. Um, and that's a very important, significant meeting because at that meeting, the um, S20, uh, this is the, the group of uh, academies of science in the 20 countries, uh, also had a meeting. And IAP was invited to organize a session uh, on food and nutrition security and agriculture. And uh, you can see the, some of the guys that are uh, with us here. <laughs> Volker is one of them. Uh, but that was a, a huge success for IAP as well. And I, I, uh, perhaps uh, some of the recommendations that was reached by the uh, IAP in this session was somehow fed into uh, uh, the, the declaration. And the declaration that, was, that resulted from the uh, G20 meeting uh, very, uh, uh, was very specific. They wanted to reaffirm their commitment to food security and to achieve a world free of hunger uh, and all forms of malnutrition um, and promote the dynamism in rural areas and sustainable agriculture. So this is all good, but again, uh, I mention again, uh, the implementation and the action. Uh, and I, I really hope something will come, come out of that. Uh, but the engagement of IEP was something very critical, and it is our hope that the IEP will be engaged in future meetings. But there are three countries that belong to the G20 that several years ago have established a project that I, I really find one of the best cooperation uh, to alleviate poverty. Because this is the cooperation between three countries, uh, IPSA, a very well-known uh, uh, initiative, um, uh, India, Brazil, and South Africa. And um, they have been supporting uh, countries like Haiti, Ghana, Zambia, and my own country, in various forms, uh, looking at young laborers, uh, uh, improving their skills, and secure jobs for them, uh, smallholder farmers in Zambia. It's a, it's a beautiful initiative, an initiative coming from a group, a group of uh, the G20. It just happened that uh, this group is from the developing world, uh, but working together to help, to help the poorer countries. Unfortunately, it's a small amount of money they put in. It's not much. I think every country puts something like a million dollars. So it's really not much. But there is a possibility of expanding it and also initiating something similar to it. And I, I, th I think as a model, I really like it as a model. OK, so deploying and scaling frontier technologies, uh, for me, is, is, is very, very important. Uh, and these are the technologies that hold um, the future for eradicating poverty. Uh, and um, some of them were discussed yesterday and the day before yesterday. Uh, but these are the four most important technologies um, I see the information and communication technologies with the digitization, the artificial intelligence, um, the big data, the drones, the robots, then the biotechnologies and genomics, uh, the nanotechnologies, and the renewable energy technologies. Now, there is a recent publication by UNCTAD, a very, very important publication, where it looked at all these technologies and gave concrete examples, concrete examples, how they can transform the lives of people. 
and how they can be instrumental in achieving the, the sustainable development goal. It's a publication that's online. You can download it and read it. But just to give you very quick examples uh, in, in the area of information communication technologies, these are certain benefits that African farmers are receiving now uh, for, for example, uh, the, the, the phone providing farmers with instant access to markets just by calling with their mobile, by their mobile phone, calling certain markets to find out uh, the, 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 the prices and the, and, and the time and place where they could get more, uh, most uh, benefit for their products. Satellite-based information on crop growth, moisture and minerals to selected farmers. The drones, uh, this by the way, is uh, extremely important uh, um, uh, 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 initiative that uh, started in Africa in certain places, uh, and but it is spreading. And in fact, this is a publication that was, uh, was done by the African Union. It's an African Union publication. So the African Union, apparently these are the decision makers, the policy makers, seem to be very interested in scaling up the drones in, in Africa. And then of course there is the precision agriculture and the big data uh, and so on. Agricultural biotechnology, we talked a lot about this uh, yesterday and the day before yesterday. Uh, it is very important uh, to see the benefits. The benefits are very important. Um, pest resistant, drought, drought resistant and higher crop yields. Um, reducing use of insecticides, increasing nutrition value and vitamin level of crops domestication of indigenous and underutilized food crops. And it's very interesting to see that Brazil uh, is actually the second largest country in the world in the biotechnology, uh, in the production of biotechnology crops. I think it is largely soybeans, right? Uh, and, and, uh, and wheat, wheat or maize, sorry. Uh, Africa uh, is a bit of a difficulty they cannot make up their mind 100% because of the pressure from the Europeans, unfortunately. But they are slowly becoming familiar with the issue and they are slowly entering the area of biotech and genetic, genetically modified crops. BT, BT cotton uh, is certainly the largest success in Africa, uh, especially in South Africa, Sudan and Kenya. Um, South Africa is the only country that produces genetically modified uh, crop like maize. And um, uh, fortunately, Uganda has finally decided after years and years of discussion that they should produce uh, bananas that are resistant to bacterial uh, wilt uh, using um, genetic modification. So they've just approved the law and I think they have started to, to plant the uh, genetically modified uh, banana. It's important for Uganda, why? Because Uganda is the second largest producer of banana in the world, second, after India, okay? And at the same time, if you look at the consumption of banana per capita, it's number one in the world. So everybody eats banana in large quantities in Uganda. So it's such an important crop for them. So I'm very glad that they managed to sort out this problem because it devastated large areas of, uh, of uh, banana fields in, in Uganda. Agricultural genomics, uh, again, th that was talked about, uh, the importance of uh, this revolution in bioinformatics, which uh, will uh, lead to uh, genome sequencing and editing, the CRISPR, uh, and all that was discussed. It's, 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 it's really very promising, very promising. Why? Because it's simple. It's not sophisticated. It's simple, and it's affordable, and it's scalable. And it is considered by experts, many, many experts, as just a way of um, having conventional breeding, but doing it very fast and doing it in a modern way. Uh, this is the, the, the view of many experts in this field. And 13 countries, by the way, including Brazil, uh, Argentina, and Canada, uh, have jointly uh, signed the statement in support of, uh, of this initiative precision precision biotechnology. But again, the EU is a problem because the EU just announced that gene-edited crops should be regulated like the way they regulate GMOs. So that is a bit disturbing in many ways. 
Okay, Na nanotechnology, how, how many minutes do I have? 20? Oh, already 40. Oh gosh, so I have, I have, to, I have to move forward. So nanotechnology is uh, another technology that, uh, that is very important uh, for uh, 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 providing uh, more efficient, uh, affordable solar energy and efficient water purification. Uh, so that, that, that again is, is, is promising. Um, uh, this is a uh, one Tanzanian scientist, young scientist, who managed to use uh, nanotechnology uh, to purify water and, uh, and to build a customized low-cost water filtration system uh, that can really transform uh, the quality of water in Africa. Um, I like his statement uh, that uh, I want to be a millionaire, uh, not in terms of money, but in terms of impacting millions of lives. And uh, again, this is uh, also an example of arsenic uh, uh, water, how nanotechnology could help there. And then the renewable energy technology. The renewable energy technology is uh, a very, very important issue for the whole world. Uh, but it is uh, remarkable to see how China is investing in renewable energy. Uh, in the year 2012, uh, they provided 30% of the total um, expenditure in renewable energy, uh, R&D expenditure. Uh, in uh, the year 2015, that jumped to 36%, and 2017, 45% of the world total of uh, expenditure in renewable energy was provided by China. Can you move it? Okay. Okay, but it's really it's, 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 it's Africa that really has a great potential in renewable energy, uh, and because you can see that uh, they have certain 325 days of bright sunlight, large coastline, uh, geothermal and hydropower, and yet 70% of rural Africans uh, have no electricity. So Africa really needs global partnership when it comes to renewable energy, and. Um, and, and most of the people in rural areas, they really need a small amount of electricity just to be able uh, to, uh, uh, to power, uh, to have pumps, uh, to pump water, to drink and for irrigation, uh, solar electricity for homes and schools, and solar electricity for storage. So they need a small amount of, of, of electricity to enable them to have a, a, a happy life. All right, so um, uh, building research and innovation into renewable capacities, um, uh, this is really quite quite a long uh, story, um, and unfortunately I may not have <laughs> that much time to deal with it. Uh, but this is really very important, and there are four issues here I would like to cover, uh, but I will, I will go quickly uh, through them. Sustainability science, um, is an is a, for me, is a very important uh, approach to research if you really want to have research that can contribute to poverty reduction. Uh, it is an approach uh, that is uh, defined by problems. Um, it's, it's not, uh, it, you, you identify a problem, whether it is a water problem or an energy problem, and then you form a research around it. So it's uh, defined by problems rather than disciplines, and uh, it uses um, uh, uh, problem-driven methodologies, uh, promoting linkages between research and innovation on science and society. And uh, the important thing about it is that it has this integration of multiple forms of innovation, including science and technology, uh, social and business innovation. This is really the key to sustainability science is this diagram. Oh, it's not appearing there. Okay. Okay, so uh, sustainability science integrating innovations. So science and technology innovation is very fundamental, of course, but science and technology innovation alone will not solve the problems unless at the same time and simultaneously you integrate it with social innovation, with business innovation, and with governance innovation. This is the only way that you can have a product that you can scale and you can sustain and the society will accept it. 
So this is, this is what uh, sustainability science is all about. Um, a very, very good example of sustainability science is this, um, this lab that was built by Stanford Center on uh, poverty and inequality, and it is called Poverty and Technology Lab. Poverty and Technology Lab. So uh, uh, it is, it is in, its objective is to use technology in innovative ways to solve global problems of poverty and inequality. And um, it, it has uh, workshops, uh, training programs, and you can see the participants here include uh, not only the scientists, uh, the economists, and the business people, but also the students, and the low-income communities, and the Silicon Valley companies as well. Uh, so they bring everybody to talk about a very specific uh, issue they want to solve. And they also introduce very recently uh, education into this. Uh, so they have uh, classes being taught in the universities. That's a very, very good example for other universities to follow. Uh, but sustainability science uh, is, is really a new field of transdisciplinary research. Uh, because as I mentioned, it involves all sorts of innovations. Uh, fortunately, now it is becoming um, a, an important area of research in its own self. Uh, there is a report uh, by uh, Elsevier and CyberNet uh, that showed that 3% uh, of the world publications relate to sustainability science, and this is increasing annually by 8%. Uh, but they observed also a north-south divide. 76% of the publications in sustainability science come from very high-income countries, and most of these publications are actually collaborative publications between the countries in the north. So the south contributes very little, and the low-income country only 2%. Uh, at the same time, you have top universities in the world like Harvard, Stanford, Tokyo, and Helsinki, uh, uh, offering degrees, master's degree and PhD degrees in sustainability science. So it is really a, a very attractive uh, area of research now for those who really want to get involved in um, real uh, life uh, problems. Uh, it is very pleasing to see that next week there's going to be a major event here in Brazil, and that is the second world symposium on sustainability science and research. Uh, and that is, these are the objectives to provide a platform to discuss the contribution of sustainability science and research towards the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. I'm not sure whether the academy here, the Brazilian Academy, is aware of this meeting, uh, but it's, it's important, I think, we link up with them. All right, science education and science literacy, I would probably uh, omit this, uh, but I just want to highlight the importance of artificial intelligence and the information technology in education now. China is really paying a lot of attention to this. And they feel that this is the only way uh, to empower the rural education and to ensure that no student gets left out. Uh, so they are they're using all sorts of techniques and technologies, including robots and so on. It's an interesting initiative they are, they are following. But um, inquiry-based science education of IEP, uh, something that we heard about many times, is also extremely important. And then the science literacy, the museums, the science museums are also very important to introduce science uh, in a very interesting and interactive way to the general public. Um, all right, so supporting students and agri researchers, uh, and again, I, I will go very quickly on this. Um, this is, it's, uh, I just want to highlight some of the work of TUAS and the World Organization for Women in Science. These are the countries that TUAS really focuses on when it deals with uh, uh, research grants, with uh, fellowships. So these are the really the poorest countries in the world, uh, the countries that are really lagging behind all other countries in the world in the area of science and technology. That in they include the 48 least developed countries and 14 lower income countries. Um, and the biggest program that TWAS has to address this issue of gap is a training program, uh, providing fellowships for students from these LDCs and the low-income countries to travel to places where they have centers of excellence, where science is, is strong, but only in the developing countries. Uh, so you see the flow to Brazil, to China, and to India, and to South Africa. Uh, so these are, uh, this, is, this is roughly about 650 fellowships offered every year going to these countries. Uh, this is just one example. Uh, this is a very interesting case, just shows how successful this can be in addressing also issues related to poverty. This is a, a young 
scientist from Nigeria. He was awarded a fellowship to go to China. He was trained in China. And then after that, he got elected into TWAS Young Affiliates. And then after that, he was awarded the research grant. And he used that research grant uh, to develop inexpensive new material made of clay and papaya seeds uh, to remove harmful metals from water uh, that uh, could provide low cost of clean water to millions of poor people in the developing world. So this is an innovation, a science innovation. But of course, it lacks, it still lacks the other innovations. So he has to link up with the other innovators, the social innovators and the business innovators, it's going to be tough. The uh, women organization are doing something similar to that. Uh, but the women, of course, facing a very difficult uh, problem, and this is what they call the scissors diagram. They start pretty well when it goes to undergraduate students, and then when it comes to postgraduate, the, the number becomes less, and then when it goes to senior positions and professors, uh, you see how it works. The number drops down dramatically. So this is uh, an issue that was addressed by this women organization. So they developed a, a, a research grant program to help these women scientists uh, to become uh, leaders in uh, their own field. Uh, building institutional capacities, um, there are three issues. Institutions are very important, but there are three issues one should really consider. You want to build um, uh, in, in, uh, capacities of institutions of higher education uh, because you really need to attract and train and retain the best and brightest students to research in global problems. Uh, at the moment, um, uh, th this mechanism is not there, but you, you really need to do it. Uh, um, uh, and then you need to have uh, institutions to develop, adapt, and deploy frontier science and technology to alleviate poverty. And also you need to have institutions and th that can scale up the innovations for poverty alleviation and to bring these innovations to market. Uh, World-class universities are very important. Uh, these are some of the universities in in, in here, in Brazil, uh, it's very, very important to have at least one such wonderful university to connect research to education, to set standards for quality and excellence, and to attract the best and brightest students, and to link, of course, frontier knowledge and innovation to global challenges, and, and or to adopt this integrated innovation approach in research and education. Um, but you see, the it is difficult for many of these poor countries uh, to have world-class universities. That, that requires a lot of money uh, to sustain it also. But you can consider just building building units of excellence within the university, just units of excellence. This is the exercise of TWAS, uh, having a competitive research program, identifying the best research groups working in the least developed countries, and then giving them grants to help them to scale up their research work. Uh, fortunately, the World Bank copied this exercise uh, but in a bigger way. Uh, so the World Bank, you know, the for the last three or four years, has been offering, um, gr not grants, loans to African governments to build centers of excellence within their universities. Uh, and this is the first time we see African governments really committing themselves, taking money from the bank, uh, of course it's a soft loan, uh, 20 years, 30 years, but taking money to build institutions within universities. It's a new phenomenon, but it works very well. And it's a huge amount of money. Each institution gets about $8 million. It's a huge amount of money. This is the latest center that has been built on climate smart agriculture. Uh, so that, that this is something I really would like to see continued somehow. And then finally, I just want to put uh, the this information about the Technology Bank. Uh, this, again, is an initiative of the United Nations General Assembly uh, to build a facility that can support the least developed countries in their efforts to commercialize research and to get patents for it. Uh, it is based in Turkey and it is just about to operate now. Okay, so uh, uh, key messages. Uh, I don't have, I have, I had a large number of key messages, but I would like just to summarize those. Um, SDGs implementation strategies must be embedded into national development plans to get appropriate funding. If, we d if every country is now developing a strategy for SDGs, but these strategies are just isolated from, from, from the development plans of the country, so it cannot be funded, so it won't work. And that is the problem that we have. I know it in my own country. I mean, uh, the, the economists and <laughs> the finance minister doesn't talk about the implementation of the, of the, of the, of the SDGs. Uh, and then translating global agreements, uh, as, as I said, uh, 
uh, related SDGs with commitments and action is very crucial. Uh, and then promoting SD STI for poverty and hunger alleviation and global sustainability will really require strengthening the scientific research and education in the universities. And um, uh, this is the final slide. Uh, universities should be encouraged to include sustainability for science and integrated innovations approach in their research and education uh, to produce scalable and affordable solutions to sustainability problems. And developing countries in particular should enhance their capacity in sustainability science. Uh, this will require uh, scientific leadership in the South and global partnership, North South and South South. And finally, uh, this is for IAP, uh, academies of science under IAP guidance should uh, follow the example of the US National Academies to design and implement programs in sustainability science. So I didn't have time to talk about this National Academies program on sustainability science. It's a huge program, very effective, uh, very fruitful. It has been going on for years and years. Is that right, Bill? For many years it has been going on. I participated in some of the workshops there. But it is something that is, that is done by an academy of sciences or academies of science, science, medicine, and engineering. And I think IAP uh, should really try to look at it and, and see if they really want to get involved in sustainability issues and, and SDGs. Here again, an example, interestingly, that has been very successful, very successful. And I think it's just a matter of just making it known to the rest of the academies of IAP and to see if it can attract some of the academies uh, to implement a similar program. Okay, and so with that, I thank you very much for your attention. I'm sorry that I kept so long. <laughs> Thank you, Mohammed, for this nice sum up of uh, the several actions and initiatives regarding uh, the, uh, uh, the sustainable development goals. So uh, very useful. I learned actually many things that I didn't know <laughs> were happening <laughs> in the world. And I think uh, it's, uh, these are nice examples for us. And it's a nice material also that we should, uh, we should have. Now, uh, we have uh, a short time for uh, short uh, questions. Uh, let's say, uh, let us have three questions uh, now. Mauricio, just one first question. So you ask your question, and then you have two more before you, you reply to them. Yes, Mauricio. Yes. Thank you very much for your uh, very comprehensive uh, uh, presentation. My question is uh, related to the credibility of science. I think it's very important to discuss and to think about it now. Uh, we know all the fantastic things that the natural sciences have uh, provided uh, to us. But I doubt that uh, the natural sciences are providing us with the right uh, narratives to communicate with the society that is emerging now. We have a society that is more urban, more educated, uh, that is requi richer, requiring a lot uh, more from us. And I, I have this uh, question about uh, the narratives that are emerging from the natural uh, sciences uh, to this society. And uh, I see an emerging new branch of science, which is the complexity science, uh, which I think is uh, trying to, to merge natural sciences with the social sciences so that we uh, get uh, better able to construct uh, narratives that will uh, reach the minds and the hearts of this complex society that is emerging now. I would like to hear your perspective on this, your, yeah. your, just your view very, on this. Very, very quickly, just uh, to answer this. I, I think this is a very important observation. And I think this is the whole purpose of the sustainability science. You see, I mean, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's science and technology, but, but making it, it's a problem. You define a problem, but that problem should be solved by all the other innovations not just science and technology. And I think this observation that you made uh, can fit in quite quite nicely there. I think um, uh, in the short term, uh, maybe in a few years, after this journal of sustainability science, which I didn't uh, uh, mention, I, uh, I, I, I forgot to mention it, uh, that, is, um, that is published by Elsevier, uh, is, is really addressing some of the research itself in areas 
very similar to what you have just observed. I, I haven't read the articles or most of the articles, but this is the whole purpose of it, uh, that, that there, is, there is a gap in our knowledge ab about, about the problems and how we can work together to solve the problem. Thank you. Questions? Yes. the narrative issue, which I also think is important. But one of the challenges for the science community is trying to figure out how better to communicate and listen to and engage with uh, society as well as policymakers, listening as well as talking at them. I'd be very curious in your experiences in Africa engaging with uh, political leaders as well as broader segments of society and, and delivering this message on what science can do for action plans of countries to on the SDGs. Well, it, it's well, really very. Let's uh, get some more questions. But I might forget this one. <laughs> <laughs> well, just one more. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Any further questions? So go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, as you know, Bill, I mean, this is really a common problem. Uh, of course, it's very severe in in, in low-income countries, and the countries where science is um, not uh, that uh, developed. Um, uh, but communicating uh, the messages, the key messages, uh, to the decision makers and also to the public um, is something that is uh, very complicated and it requires certain skills, I must say. Um, uh, the media can play a role, uh, but in, in places like, uh, like Africa and, and many of the least developed countries, uh, the media is not strong enough, it's not professional enough to take the message and then translate it in a simple way, in simple form to the decision makers. And I think the problem is, I mean, the decision makers would like to, to know, uh, but how you convey that message and the way you convey it, I think can make a lot of difference. Uh, if you complicate it, uh, nobody will understand it. Uh, but if you make it simple and make it appealing and attractive, the message can get through. But this is a, a problem common to, to, all, to all regions uh, around the world, and I think IAP uh, is trying to address this issue through his program of communication, one of the flagship programs on communications. Uh, so uh, just a comment, we are going to go back to these questions of communication and si in relation between science and policy in the very last section of this meeting, which is about science and policy. And uh, in fact, uh, the, the speakers of that section, we have uh, uh, arranged that yesterday, uh, each of each of the speakers will speak for only 10 minutes so that we have time for discussions on this very important subject of uh, relationship between science and science policy, actually, and how, how this is implemented and what kind of actions we might have. So we are going back to this question. Now, uh, I think it's time to go to the next uh, session. So thank you very much, Mohammed. Okay, so uh, let's move to the next session uh, that will be on tackling poverty and inequality. And I invite Professor um, Julian May to coordinate the session. Well, good morning, everybody. I'll not ask the speakers to come up because this very large stage means we'll spend a lot of time running on and off. Rather, they should stay where they are and we can take the presentations there. So the first thing is just to open up this session is to reflect on, well, what then is poverty? Is it some kind of virus, is it a parasite, uh, a bacteria that we need to deal with? Or is it something that happens to humans and possibly is something that might be produced by other humans and by the environments in which they live? I think we have three speakers that are going to be able to ask some of those questions. Because if we're going to reflect on what is poverty and we're going to think about how public how scientists can do something about influencing the reduction of poverty, we need to think about what are the mechanisms, what are the ways in which something can be done about po a poverty. Now, key for scientists, that means influencing public policy, and it can mean influencing the public. But to do that, we need to understand the dynamics that influence both policy 
and the public. There are three that we I can certainly think of. We touched on one yesterday, which was the kinds of nutrition transitions that people go through, how food habits change, how diet habits change, how people are able to get the food security that they need. But there are two others which I think our speakers will address today. The one is the notion of demographic transitions, the movement of people, the aging of people, how fertility changes, how m m um, and so forth. And the other are epidemiological transitions, how issues of mortality and morbidity change, the illnesses that people have, the movement from not communicable diseases to non-communicable diseases. And finally, there is the environment, how we try and shape that environment to respond to these changes, and particularly how we re-engineer that environment. So I'm going to take our speakers then in a slightly different order, if you would bear with that. We have three. Ramula Shilo. Um, just go to that bio. He has a background in civil engineering and a PhD in urban development planning at the Institute of Urbanism de Paris. Um, he is going to be talking to the issues, I think, of engineering, and I'd like to invite him to be our first speaker. We'll then move on to Axel Izia. So Axel, if you could prepare yourself to be the second speaker and also the presenters for Axel to be the second speaker. And finally, our third speaker, Toro Ono, who I will introduce at that time. Tomem susto a sua cópia das transparências. Uh, bom dia a todos. Eu queria primeiro parabenizar a Academia Brasileira de Ciências e ao Interacadêmic Partnership por essa iniciativa, e, evidentemente, a todos os participantes. E queria também parabenizar as apresentações anteriores, especialmente esta última do professor Mohamed Hassan. É, eu venho as últimas palavras aqui agora do chair da mesa. Eu venho da Universidade Federal do Rio de Janeiro, da COP, sou engenheiro, e a questão tecnológica aqui termina colocando para mim uma situação muito curiosa, né? tentar responder essa questão central, como ciência e tecnologia contribuem para a redução da pobreza e das desigualdades, e, sob uma ótica, né, sob olhar o campo da mobilidade urbana, área que eu venho trabalhando há um tempinho. Com a primeira vista, eu acho que o impulso inicial de todos nós é ver uma nova tecnologia resolvendo tudo isso. Que seja um trem voador, que seja a tecnologia software, ou a, que eu estou chamando de mobilidade 4.0. Mas eu imagino que essa é uma parte apenas da resposta. Ela é importante, sem dúvida, é, o avanço tecnológico é, dos transportes, modificou muito a vida humana, até mesmo a começar pelas cidades, a escala e o tamanho delas. Mas a gente tem que lembrar que mobilidade urbana, o transporte, melhor dizendo, é essencialmente um serviço. E é um serviço que não é estocável, então, lugares vazios não são reocupados. Né? As dimensões de tempo e espaço são inerentes ao próprio produto transporte. E, e não basta ser onde produzir, é também por onde produzir, porque o atendimento é feito no caminho. Tá? Então, para tentar compreender a, a relação entre pobreza com mobilidade urbana, a gente também tem que entender a relação do urbanismo, da ocupação espacial, onde se realizam as atividades, onde as pessoas moram. Eu acho que aí, segundo o meu olhar, é onde está o foco principal da possibilidade do segmento do setor mobilidade urbana ajudar a reduzir a pobreza, combatê-la, reduzi-la. Então, é, 
eu poderia pensar o seguinte, de que forma a mobilidade poderia aumentar diretamente a renda dos mais pobres? Eu vejo com certa cautela, na medida em que, é, talvez apenas na parte da produção do serviço, né, melhorar, adequar, é, a gente tem experiências mundiais, uma muito rica da África do Sul, em que os negros não tinham acesso aos trens, se não quando os brancos permitiam. E essa movimentação deles de criar o que nós chamamos aqui de transporte alternativo foi uma grande, grande mudança, é, não só nas possibilidades de mobilidade, mas na vida pessoal de cada um deles, de suas famílias e tudo. Ah, mas eu vejo a ciência e tecnologia voltada para entender isso, ela vai ter que trabalhar em, em ocupação espacial, tá? a forma urbana, onde estão distribuídas as atividades, por que, que elas estão distribuídas dessa forma, e como é que o transporte se realiza, como é que ele se junta às famílias, né? como é que ele está próximo das famílias. Meu porquê a mobilidade é importante, tanto para o desenvolvimento da família, seu crescimento, sua reprodução, quanto para a própria economia urbana. Daí duas perguntas. Como é que o transporte sofre interferência do uso do solo e vice-versa? E eu me dispus a discutir aqui, eu trazia algumas reflexões dessas ações exclusivamente no estrito senso no campo da mobilidade urbana, deixando as ações ligadas à economia urbana, ligadas à promoção de empregos, coisas tipo, para outro campo de responsabilidade. Não que não sejam importantes, ao contrário, mas eu me dispus aqui a trabalhar especificamente estrito senso da mobilidade urbana. E, e trago uma reflexão que fiz aqui, que fiz... Dizemos, eu posso até dizer, foi uma, uma boa equipe, uma grande equipe, no estudo de um plano estratégico da, plano estratégico da, da região metropolitana do Rio de Janeiro, de desenvolvimento. É, é, a primeira, que eu diria é o seguinte, de, de que forma, que ações, é, que grupo de ações podem ajudar a reduzir os gastos familiares em mobilidade? Isso é um dado importante. E o segundo... Quer dizer, ao reduzir, a gente pode até dizer que há um aumento de renda, no sentido de que mais renda fica disponível para outras atividades. E um segundo de ações da mobilidade urbana são ações que possibilitem, sobretudo as chamadas mais pobres, maior diversidade de acesso. Acesso ao trabalho, acesso à busca de trabalho, acesso a locais de consumo, acesso à educação, à saúde e tudo isso. Esse é o outro enfoque extremamente importante. Então, a gente vai tentar começar a entender um pouquinho, ou trabalhar um pouquinho, essas ações. É, então, o nosso alvo é entender né, como essa a mobilidade teria alguma potência, que potencial ela teria para ajudar isso. Então, a gente vai fazer uma primeira análise muito rápida, porque eu imagino que a maior parte aqui não vem dessa área de urbanismo, dessa área de transporte. Né? Bom, em que pé estamos? Né? Onde estamos? Para onde nós estamos indo? Para onde nossas cidades estão indo? Para onde nossas soluções estão levando? E o que é que a gente pode fazer para modificar o que for necessário modificar? Bom, a primeira é uma frase que eu acho até interessante. Bom, desculpa, aqui é o... Pulo daqui. Bom, onde vamos, para onde devemos ir e o que podemos fazer para mudar a respeito. Eu gosto dessa frase, que a cidade é a maior invenção da humanidade depois da roda. Eu até pensei que cidade colocar aqui, a variedade é tão grande que eu preferi me, me <risos> restringir à cidade do Rio para evitar toda e qualquer polêmica. Mas a gente percebe aí, talvez já tenha sinalizado um pouquinho antes, que tudo que se faz, tudo que se produz, tudo que acontece na cidade... E a mobilidade já foi recentemente no Brasil definida como mais um direito, tá? dentre os direitos à habitação, direito à educação, direito à saúde, a mobilidade urbana passa a ser um direito. Mesmo porque, pelo tamanho das cidades hoje em dia, é ilusório imaginar que tudo possa ser feito a pé ou em bicicleta. Né? Então, vamos fazer uma perguntinha agora. Onde é que nós estamos? Onde é que ficam os mais pobres? Onde é que ficam os pobres, os mais pobres? Como é que eles se movem? Quanto gastam? Essa é a questão central. Para nós, mexendo com mobilidade, é uma questão central. E a gente vê nesse mapa aí, 
usando uma, uma linguagem um pouco solta, que a pobreza mora longe. Uma frase um pouquinho feia, mas é verdade. As, as cidades do terceiro mundo, em geral, ou dos países em desenvolvimento, das economias emergentes, né, é, os pobres moram mais longe. Eu acho que é. Quanto mais clara o amarelo aí, menor é a faixa de renda familiar. E naquele pontinho ali, onde é que está o vermelho aqui? Nesse pontinho aqui hum, está o centro da cidade do Rio. Aqui você tem a zona sul, aqui tem a barba, observa a diferença e para onde as pessoas vão. E, 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 e adversamente, uma enorme quantidade, uma parcela muito grande das atividades, dos empregos estão, estão no centro. Mas é importante, já não é mais aquilo que era há 40 anos atrás. Isso é muito importante nas mudanças de agora. E esse processo, que inclusive o, o Muhammad é, é, acabou de mostrar aqui, há no mundo inteiro um processo de urbanização. E as cidades se tornando maiores. Esse gráfico da ONU mostra as cidades acima de 200 mil habitantes. No caso africano, por exemplo, nós já temos Lagos, Quinhaça, o Cairo, mas já temos aqui também a Abeba. Né? De todos os países, a África está com 1,2 bilhão de habitantes, mas, numa faixa aqui de uns, de uns 40, uns, talvez 80 anos, ela deve ultrapassar a Ásia. É um crescimento absurdamente grande. Cidades crescendo em tamanho, crescendo em população, e a mobilidade passa a ser um fator crucial na vida dessas pessoas. Eu não gostaria que essas cidades sofressem um processo de urbanização e organização que as cidades brasileiras tiveram no século passado. Um crescimento grande, mas sem ordenamento, e como se o centro fosse tudo, e as cidades mudaram muito nos últimos 40 anos. Para se ter uma ideia, é, espera-se que Nova Delhi cresça e ultrapasse Tóquio. E países outros, tá? também com população muito grande. Na América Latina, que tem sido principalmente minhas preocupações, eu confesso aqui, <risos> faz parte do meu objeto principal de pesquisa, nós já temos é, uma grande quantidade de cidades com população alta. Não apenas São Paulo, Belo Horizonte e Rio de Janeiro. Nós temos na América Central, cidades de grandes, nós temos populações muito grandes, né? o Peru, o Lima, está com quase 10 milhões de habitantes. Então, é, a gente tem que percebe que esse problema é, é, é mundial. Mas, se a gente quiser olhar um pouquinho de perto as camadas mais pobres, a mobilidade, a gente vai ver o seguinte, olhando por continente, nós vemos aqui que os países mais é, de menor, digamos assim, economias mais fracas, né, a proporção do transporte público ainda é alta, né? e o transporte individual ainda é baixo. Nada se compara à América do Norte e à Austrália, em especial. Né? Mas, olha, a Ásia, olha a quantidade de transporte individual, e a América Latina e a África também. E isso é uma propriedade, é uma característica que temos que ter muito cuidado em preservar. Nós não temos dinheiro, e mesmo se tivéssemos, não sei se seria razoável, é basear nossa mobilidade no transporte individual, ainda que tivéssemos dinheiro. Então, o automóvel não é a base da mobilidade nessas cidades das economias emergentes. E a gente vai ter que buscar a solução para todo mundo. E as camadas mais pobres, a gente vê mais fortemente essa questão. Esse dado é um pouquinho velho aqui do Rio de Janeiro, mas ele ilustra assim. Como as camadas mais mais pobres, de baixa renda, né? aqui, é, transporte individual, transporte coletivo e transporte não motorizado. 96% ou 50% é não motorizado. Mas as camadas ricas, ou é, é completamente motorizada, e maior parte é transporte individual. Um número para que todos nós nos espantemos, na cidade do Rio de Janeiro, mesmo na região metropolitana do Rio de Janeiro, dos deslocamentos motorizados, a cada quatro deslocamentos motorizados, três são em transporte público. Então, nós temos que ter muito cuidado para preservar até mesmo essa divisão modal 
Não inverter, como São Paulo já empatou, Belo Horizonte já está perto, o que é um problema muito sério. E esse crescimento é, ele tem que ser pautado não apenas na, no mercado, mas por ações governamentais importantes, porque, senão, é, as, até as próprias camadas mais pobres se sentem obrigadas a usar transporte individual, o que aumenta a sua despesa. E esse dado é interessante, esse dado do IBGE, mostra que as camadas mais pobres, que estão aqui até o decil número 7, ah, essas aqui já estão gastando mais em transporte privado do que no individual. Ah, então, a, o retorno às políticas para poder garantir um bom transporte público, mas não é somente mais, nós vamos ver mais adiante, né? é, 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 por onde né? é, a produção ela tem os, uma questão de tempo e de espaço como dimensão própria de transporte. Né? Então, nós temos que ter muito cuidado com, com, com isso. Né? É, nós temos que salvaguardar esse modelo. E a gente apresenta aqui, então, um, uma síntese da, de alguns problemas principais da política de mobilidade urbana para a América Latina, para a cidade da América Latina. Eu tenho receio de não poder expandir isso para todo o resto do mundo, mas eu acredito que, em grande parte dos países desenvolvidos, em desenvolvimento, isso também é válido. Né? O primeiro, as metrópoles da América Latina são espraiadas. E quanto maior a distância, tudo é mais caro. Diferente das grandes cidades asiáticas, que são concentradas, são, têm uma densidade muito alta. Mumbai tem a maior densidade do mundo, cerca de 350 habitantes por habitante. Atlanta tem seis habitantes por, quilo, por, por hectare. A outra tem 350. Nós não temos condição de ter uma mobilidade é, com, pautada nas cidades americanas. Embora todos nós achemos que o automóvel é a felicidade em quatro rodas. Né? É, esse processo de espraiamento ele é largamente é, ajudado, apoiado, por investimentos que priorizam o uso do automóvel. Quando se constrói uma autoestrada radial, tá, está se sinalizando para as pessoas, pode morar um pouco mais longe, que você chega para o trabalho. Então, a nossa política é velocidade moderada, não só pelas questões de segurança, mas para tornar a cidade mais eficiente e isso tornar menos custosa para os pobres. Ah, embora tenha essa política, ainda assim, é, o transporte público é a base da mobilidade nessas cidades todas. E, mais interessante, é que nós temos, a despeito de tudo isso, ainda, se su ainda surgem novas centralidades, o que é uma vantagem que nós podemos fazer uso. É como eu é, é, se nós pegarmos a região metropolitana, ou a cidade do Rio de Janeiro, fica mais simples, é, é, de manhã, no horário de pico, viagens de motivo trabalho, viagens de motivo de estudo, que são aquelas obrigatórias, apenas 25% delas vão para a área central. Os outros 75% vão para outros lugares. Mas as lógicas, paradigmas de 40 anos atrás, insistem em redes centrais, em redes axiais, redes radiais. Ah, isso não, não, não ajuda muito, né? a despeito dessa nova morfologia, que nós poderíamos tentar diminuir as distâncias, e não apenas os tempos, né, de, o tempo vindo, sendo reduzido pela redução das distâncias, motivando o crescimento das, das, das novas centralidades, é, a, a despeito de tudo isso, os grandes investimentos feitos no Brasil e nas grandes cidades africanas agora, tá, voltam-se para acentuar as ligações axiais, expandindo o espraiamento. Né? Ah, bom, essas outras acho que vocês já leram mais rapidamente do que eu. Né? Bom, termino? Uau! I have to go very, very, very fast. Bom, alguns pilares que, que ah, ah, garantem o que, o que sustentam essa... essa Diferença. Um planejamento setorial voltado para esse tipo de política, uma, um, um financiamento perverso da mobilidade, porque as camadas que usam o automóvel não participam, embora se beneficie do transporte público, não participam do seu financiamento, Há uma gestão ineficiente pública, falta de controle social e desenvolvimento 
ambiental associado ao desenvolvimento urbano. Eu vou ter que ser bastante mais rápido, porque é, para onde nós estamos indo, nós estamos indo para uma solução tá, de é, repetir esse processo, tá, fazendo investimentos que apenas é, acentuam esse processo. Então, a nossa discussão, vocês vejam aqui como exemplos, cidades apresentando redes novamente radiais, projetos que têm poucos anos de criado, 10 anos, 12, 15 anos. Essa aqui do Rio de Janeiro mostra muito como o espraiamento acontece, em, vocês veem como a mancha vermelha cresceu por uma ação a, de organização inadequada do espaço, que traz uma consequência séria para os usuários. Nós vamos ver aqui a, que as camadas mais que gastavam mais de duas horas, passou de 4% para 15%. Então, em termos de ciência e tecnologia, a gente tem que compreender, temos que é, questionar todo esse tipo de é, ação, né? é quebrar os paradigmas do passado. Nós temos, por exemplo, que as cidades ricas na mobilidade dita do futuro, talvez se apropriem do transporte privado, talvez tenham uma mobilidade altamente inteligente, para, como as cidades europeias podem ter, ou as cidades da Ásia, que são densas, uma mobilidade baseada no transporte limpo e partilhado. Nós temos que construir para essas outras cidades, tá? possivelmente seguindo primeiro este caminho daqui, dos, das cidades asiáticas. Então, maiores desafios agora é reduzir a estrutura radial, otimizar os nossos recursos e reorientar o uso do automóvel, quem sabe com muitas restrições. Ah, me permita aqui agora. Vou pular essa aqui, porque ela é meio longa. A gente tem... Este é o alvo principal. Este é o alvo principal. Né? As condições é, adversas de transporte não motorizado, insuficiente, porque tem gente que tem baixa renda e não consegue nem pagar direito o transporte público, ou qualidade deste tipo, que desperdiça o tempo das pessoas e as camadas mais pobres, o que elas têm unicamente para negociar e conseguir recursos é o tempo de trabalho. Nós não podemos desperdiçar o tempo de trabalho dessas pessoas em viagens longas. Temos que pensar como sair da caixa, sair daí de dentro, pensar em políticas diferentes. Sintetizando, a mobilidade, a gente tem que, primeiro, redesenhar a rede de transporte vendo, então, a multipolaridade, diminuir a distância. O sistema de transporte pode contribuir, sim, com novas linhas, linhas mais curtas, tarifas mais baixas, digamos assim, é, é alimentar e, e adubar, vamos usar essa palavra, né, essas novas centralidades. A segunda é melhorar a eficiência dessa rede. A, significa garantir claramente, no mínimo, a prioridade nas vias, para que os tempos sejam menores. A, a terceira, redirecionar o uso do automóvel. Sim, é, o espaço é público, mas ele não é democraticamente utilizado. E, por fim, reorganizar as bases de financiamento. Eu já sinalizei que a, os automobilistas são fortes beneficiados do sistema de transporte público das cidades, por ter ruas mais limpas, por ter velocidade mais alta, por reduzir o custo e o tempo. Mas não contribuem. Assim como o setor imobiliário, que também não contribui. Ah, eu não entrei, vocês já perceberam, nas cidades, é, é, num questionamento maior nas cidades que têm um uso maior de bicicletas, ou que têm um uso já muito importante de transporte ferroviário. É uma, uma falha da minha parte, eu peço desculpa a vocês. E, finalmente, eu queria... É dizer que é, tem uma frase que, que marcou e que eu acho que eu gostaria de terminar essa frase do Papa Francisco. Né? O barulho dos ricos está silenciando os pobres. Nós precisamos mudar isso. Obrigado. take questions to all three presenters at the end so we can move through the presentations. So, we've learned that poverty and inequality takes place in space. 
We've learned that science and technology takes place in space. We've learned that, that science and technology can allow us to depict space. And finally, we've learned some of the ways in which science and technology can allow us to better manage space. I'd like to call in the second speaker who would tell us a little bit more about the dynamics that are underlying these movements that were outlined in that last presentation. Um, Al Alex, you're here. Alex is the Dawn Stiff Professor of Global Health at Drexel University and a distinguished fellow of the Center for Global Development. I first met Axel about two decades ago, I guess, when he was managing the po African Population and Health Research Center, an extremely innovative project that was taking place in Kenya. Axel, 20 minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Julian, and thank you, everyone, and uh, the organizers. I think we've really had an excellent uh, two and a half days of meeting or three days of meeting on very important issues. Um, for my, actually changed my presentation I did last night, and I will talk basically on two things. Um, I will talk on two things. I will look at the issue of population and the role it plays in terms of what we are discussing here, um, poverty and inequality. And I will challenge us to think a little bit more around the issues of development and what we really mean uh, by that. I think the issue of population growth in Africa has been something that has come around many times over the past two and a half days. We've talked about it in terms of the growth as an opportunity, maybe as a challenge and as a constraint to development on the continent. But you've seen some of this graph presented in different ways. Uh, 1950, the population of Africa, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa was under uh, 180 million people. As of 2018, we are over 1 billion. And it is projected to double again by 2050, and by 2100, about 21, uh, uh, about 4 billion people by 2100. You can also look at the share of the global population that is constituted by Sub-Saharan Africa. Just barely 68 years ago, we accounted for 7% of the global population. Currently, we're at about 14%. We'll move up to 22% by 2050, and by 2100, about 36% of the global population. This is Sub-Saharan Africa alone. If you include North Africa, we'll be looking at about 40% by 2100. That's a huge demographic shift globally. Think about Europe, 1950, it was about 25% of the global population. And by 2100, it will be about 7% of the global population. So this will affect a lot of what we talk about uh, uh, going forward. But when you look at this population and people think about, is it good for Africa? Is it bad for Africa? And you might have different views on this. But let me just highlight one aspect of this that we need to be thinking about. If you look at the growth in certain age groups, I take zero to four as children who need health care, immunization, early childhood development, nutritional services to uh, uh, stop stunting and all of those. I take age group five to 14 as those who are in need of primary education and 15 to 19 as those who are in need of secondary education. So uh, primary uh, health care, in 2000, we had about 112 million children under five that we needed to take care of. In that period of 18 years, that number has grown by more than 50 million to 168 million. By 2030, when we look at the SDGs, it will be over 200 million people, children under five. So in essence, Africa will need to almost double by 2030 the investments it was making in 2000 in order to maintain the current levels of inadequate services for child health services. If you think about primary education, 
If we are currently supporting about 168 school, a million school age children, by 2050, that will increase by almost 200 million additional children. For secondary education, we will move from about 112 million now by 2050 to 212 million. That's another 100 million children in need of secondary education. And for many countries, they are moving in this direction of making primary and secondary education free and uh, uh, in, in their countries. And that means we really have to respond in a different way to dealing with these issues. Uh, another way to think about this is that for us to be able to respond to these two billion people in Sub-Saharan Africa by 2050, every single thing that is made by human hand in Africa today, we would have to double it in order to maintain the current levels of in, uh, inadequate coverage of services. Whether it is in health, we have to build new health centers and train doctors and healthcare workers. We have to build schools, healthcare uh, and, and teachers. We have to build houses, roads, everything that is made by hand in, since beginning of time. We have to double it by in the next 31 years in order to maintain the current levels that everybody is, is speaking about the last two days as being inadequate. Is technology the answer? You also have very, many different views on that. And I think as we reflect on that, there are a number of questions that we would need to to, to respond to. We've not incorporated within this the added impact of climate change in many ways that could affect a lot of these dynamics going forward. But more importantly, the action that Africa needs to take if it's going to address the population challenge on the continent are things that are very cost-effective, viable, WHO defines family planning programs as best buys, one of the best buys in development. You can address early marriage, you can address issues of access to education, and if you can do these basic little things that may not require huge investments, we could, for instance, if you look at the UN projections, this is the four billion by uh, 2100, if we simply between now and 2023, 20, which would be in a five years time, four years time, we are able to in increase age at first birth by only two years. We can reduce the ultimate population of Sub-Saharan Africa by 2100 by 10%. If we can eliminate in the next four years the number of children that are Unwanted, defined as unplanned and unwanted by their parents when they got pregnant, we eliminate that, which is about 25% currently in, in the region. We can reduce the population by about 1.1 billion. That's about 25% reduction, just simply by helping women meet their current desired family sizes. So, the with irrespective of what you think in terms of whether this large population is going to be good for Africa or bad for Africa, my stance is that nobody will be looking to hire Africans who are uneducated and sick. And in many ways, the rates of growth of this population makes it harder for many countries to make the necessary investments that are needed in human capital development, in health and education, to create that workforce that could be supportive. So, but is really addressing the population question in Africa the solution to tackling poverty on the continent? What if we can get the population growth in Africa to be at replacement level, get fertility down, and all of those? Will poverty disappear from Africa? 
um, that led me to really begin to think about some of the things we have heard over the last two days at this meeting. You know, this conference is not about Africa. It's a global conference on uh, poverty and inequality. But consistently, throughout the last two and a half days, we have heard Africa mentioned. And there is this unconscious thing that when you think about poverty, the image you get is that of Africa. And when you think of Africa, the image that it brings to you usually is that of poverty. And so you see all of this. And this unconscious thing really is part of why it has become constant in our conversations that even if Africa is going to achieve these demographic patterns change today that we are unlikely to see significant changes in poverty, and I will explain why. What is really absent in the conversations that you have on poverty and Africa and all of that, and I think Mohammed touched on this earlier, is the issue on the deafening silence of African voices on these issues. And you can see the, 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 the limited voice of Africa on these issues in many different ways. Doesn't matter what metrics you use. Africa can easily be ignored in the global knowledge production without much of a consequence. And because we are not articulating our ideas and thoughts and all those, people tell us what we need to do and what we have to do to come out of poverty. Unfortunately, the key drivers of our development programs and the key architects of those are actually not development practitioners. If you look at the global history of development and the key people that drive development discourse globally, they all, without exception, came out of a humanitarian tradition. They were created in response to humanitarian crisis, whether it is a a war that happened, the Biafran War, the Korean War, the Spanish War, whatever wars that came in, or the Second World War, First World War. These were the conditions that gave rise to the emergence of the global players in development today. And so, when you think of humanitarian crisis and dealing with it, you actually think for the people, you act for the people, you define solutions for the people, and we do not invest in systems and processes and structures that are needed to address real poverty issues and creating those things that can help you move in a sustainable way. So these are the architects. And how many of you believe that if a country in Africa, take Zambia, for example, has done exactly what they were advised by the World Bank to do, from independence to today, that Zambia would have made progress as a country. You believe that? Of course not. So, globally, I mean, you can think about the whole agenda of development as we define it, that they are actually not geared towards supporting sustainable development. You can look at concessionary loans of the World Bank. You get it if you're a country that is in crisis. You don't get it because you are making progress and it can help you really get to where the rest of the world is. Bilateral support or the global funds, um, funding mechanisms that we have. I mean, if you become a middle-income country and you've really achieved some level of success, you lose your Gavi support and all the other support, and many countries in Africa will rather rebase their economy and remain low income and, poverty, I mean poor just to be able to continue to have access to those development support. So at the end of the day, really, the international development and technical assistance systems is not what creates development. And we need to begin to rethink. If we're going to deal with poverty, then the people that are engaged and the uh, places that are dealing with the real challenges of poverty need to become architects of defining the pathway that they need to take to come out of poverty. And strong institutions, as critical
to doves. If you look at what happened in South Asia, whether you look at India, South Korea, the level of investments they made in research and development over the period that they have really moved their populations and the economies out of poverty was enormous. In Africa today, investment in science and technology, the key development partners will tell us is a luxury we cannot afford. And that's why institutions remain weak. And every single, to think about it in Africa, every single project we have done has had capacity development as a major part of it. What is the number one reason funders gave for not investing significant resources in Africa? It is lack of capacity. How is it that we are building capacity for 50 years and we can still look back and talk about lack of capacity as the major reason why we are not investing in institutions in Africa? I believe that the low investment that we are making in research and development is what is creating the weak environment for innovation. It is what is stifling human capacity development and it is what is making it hard for us to break the cycle of poverty. And if we're going to deal with it really and, uh, and seriously, we then need to begin to think about how do we build sustainable local institutions that could create the pathway for Africa's emergence out of poverty. So how should we tackle poverty in Africa? I think that the starting point might be to dismantle the global arrangements for development or refocus them on humanitarian assistance. And when we do humanitarian assistance, it's okay to do it and support it. And we can separate it from real development and then create a mechanism to really support ideas that could move countries in a sustainable pathway uh, to development. And we have to invest directly in African institutions. The current systems of sub-agreements and sub-awards and all of those, where you get only a trickle of whatever comes in development assistance to actual programs on the country, has really weakened and continues to weaken institutional systems in Africa. And African governments and countries must lead in creating the, the, the domestic investment that is needed, as we care about. So, I have talked about poverty, but this conference is also about inequality. And I want to make the last point on inequality. a decent life even without, because you have a number of social protection pr mechanisms and systems that you are not having people suffering hunger as we heard in, in the first day. So when you have in places like Nigeria, where the resource base is contracting and where the population is growing very rapidly and many more people are moving into poverty, what it does is to create certain unhealthy competition for resources that then begins to marginalize and increase inequality to the point that human survival becomes a challenge. And if we have to deal with inequality, then and the part of inequality that really troubles us, we have to then deal with the whole structures of local knowledge that can drive real development, because without that, then inequality and the type of inequality that concerns us will become harder to deal with. And that's the challenge we face in Africa today. But the way forward for me is really to create a knowledge base, a knowledge system that defines the priorities for Africa. What do we need to invest in? How do we invest? What is development for us? And how do we move forward as a country and as a continent? That is the time I really believe that the true approach to handling poverty in Africa will become meaningful. Thank you. So our science and technology might not work in all contexts. Our science and technology may not always have the outcomes that we anticipate, 
And sometimes our science and technology might be the problem rather than the solution. So can we move on to the next speaker? So I'll start with a personal comment. Economists are often known to be wrong with their predictions. Um, I'm an economist and I have to admit, I'm very proud to say that I was right, I was right about a prediction. When I first met Tola Ono, I thought here's someone who will go far and she's gone far. She's a public health physician specialist and an urban epi epidemiologist and a clinical senior research fellow at the Global Health Research Program at the University of Program. I'm proud to say that she is um, an alumna of the University of Cape Town in South Africa. And Tolo, please come and join us with your presentation. Thanks, Julian. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Okay, thank you. I need some feedback. Um, thank you to my, thank you to everyone. Thank you for the invitation, and thanks to the previous two previous speakers for really setting the scene on um, on on uh, thinking through uh, poverty and in inequity in the context of urban, in the context of urban mobility, in the broader context of the global development landscape. So as Julian mentioned, my background is in public health. Uh, my research is in urban health. And if you asked me what discipline I actually am now, I think I would just end up cataplectic because I don't really know anymore. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit on, through the lens of health inequity, focusing, starting on multi-morbidity and what s some of what Julian mentioned earlier on that kind of epidemiological trend Alex talked about, demographic transition as a start, I will talk about a little bit about the ways that we're seeing the different um, patterns of disease change over time. I will then move from disease to talk a little bit more about health because sometimes when we, when we say health, we actually mean disease and I'd quite like to focus on health. Mm, where is this way? Okay. So these are the four points I'm going to I'm going to focus on. Firstly, as I mentioned, giving that broader landscape of multimorbidity, urbanization and deprivation and equity. I'll hone in specifically on data and the role what role data and integrated approaches to thinking about data could play in prevention, disease prevention or health creation. And I'll speak a little bit about innovative health governance and I'll reflect a little bit on some of my recent ex experiences which really speak to what um, Alex ended on. And lastly, talking about the evolving skill sets um, that we, we would need to address uh, these conversations. So firstly, what we're seeing, so the notion of epidemiological transition is one that presupposes that societies move from eras of pestilence and famine into one of, uh, you know, infectious uh, epidemics and from that into an age of degenerative conditions um, and chronic uh, non-communicable diseases, things like diabetes, hypertension. But actually what we're seeing in uh, a lot of the what I said, I, I guess I'll call Global South, most of my work is in the African context, is one of a protracted transition in many uh, low and middle income countries, where instead of seeing this very neat transition, which to be honest, never existed, other than hypothetically, even in European context, what we're seeing is this uh, overlap of uh, a rise in non-communicable -commun conditions and uh, and risk factors coexisting with uh, ex uh, with infectious disease epidemics. So, this is just two slides to to uh, elaborate this to illustrate this. This is looking at in the South African context risk factors contributing to morbidity. So I've chosen to represent morbidity and not mortality because that really uh, better captures ill health because um, not all diseases that, that, are, that cause ill health necessarily cause, um, have high mortality. 
So this is using the disability adjusted life years, which looks as the years of life lost prematurely and years of life lived with disability. This is in 1990. Uh, blue is low, uh, you know, red is, red is high is the heat map. The first column is South Africa, and these are different uh, provinces across South Africa. And what you see in 1990 is if you look at the top risk factors driving uh, ill health, they are things like childhood undernutrition, unsafe water sources, unsafe sanitation, etc. And really that is uh, similar across the board. If we fast forward to 2015, Obviously, 1990 was pre the peak of the HIV epidemic, and so what you see is unsafe sex representing HIV as the highest um, contributor to, to morbidity across the board in the, in, the, in the country. But what follows? High body mass index, so obesity, high fasting plasma glucose, increased risk of diabetes, high bl blood pressure, alcohol smoking, air pollution, and then it's on nutrition. So we see in the space of really not very long, um, one generation really, a uh, transition um, in, the, in the drivers of, of, of ill health in, in this country. This is from some work we did a few years ago where, so I, I actually started my research in HIV and TB, so I was a clinician in, H in infectious diseases before I started, I went into research. And when I went to South Africa, I was working on HIV TB. And I realized that to some extent, obviously important conditions, but I, start I started seeing that the health system was not recognizing the fact that you don't get the memo that if you get HIV or TB, you, you don't get the other things, right? No, no diabetes, because that's a different clinic on a different day. You know, and I started realizing that because I was focused on this, I you almost, you're treating the disease and not the person. So we started wondering, well, just amongst people who are already in care, so this is not true burden of disease, just amongst people who are already diagnosed and who are already receiving treatment for either HIV, TB, hypertension, or diabetes, in one clinic, how much overlap is there? How much multimorbidity? Because we don't see that uh, we don't see that in one folder. So you're in one clinic, but HIV and TB very good integration. Uh, obviously, um, a lot of a lot of overlap there. So you have the same seeing the same people, but a different folder for it, diabetes, different folder for hypertension. So we looked at about 14,000 uh, people over a nine-month period to get a sense of what that overlap is. So given what we know about HIV and TB. Um, if I said what was the most common co comorbidity with HIV, you'd instinctively think TB, but it was hypertension. Why? Because hypertension is just simply the most common of those four, period, across the board. There's also some um, ongoing work that suggests that there is a higher risk um, cardiovascular disease in, in concepts of treatment of some um, um, some antiretroviral therapies. But what we saw here was really quite surprising. Firstly, about um, one in five of people with treatment for one of those four conditions had another condition. And overwhelmingly, that was hypertension. So we started thinking, well, we're not actually thinking, we're thinking in terms of how we're taught in medical school, not in terms of what the reality on the ground is. Because you're infectious, you couldn't possibly be treating or be thinking about what the reality of comorbidities is um, uh, in, 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 in the population. So that was, a, that was a surprise. And I started thinking, okay, so on one hand, we need to start thinking differently about how we treat people. But is this inevitable? Is this pattern of uh, this increasing burden, is this inevitable? And I started thinking, well, what, are, what is driving this, this transition? And do we just sit within the clinic and wait for it to happen and then treat it and treat it better, which obviously there was a lot more we needed to do? Or is there anything we could do stepping outside of the, of the clinic to start thinking about um, preventing those in the first place? So that's when I, this was a few years ago, when I 
instead of the research group looking at urban health specifically around cities' health and equity. Um, oh, this is another. This is another. Uh, another study we looked at using uh, data from the National Income Dynamics st Study or Survey. It's a panel study done in across South Africa um, in in waves. And looking at the pattern of multimorbidity, again, this is highly underestimating the true burden because this is already diagnosed or self-reported. Um, and what we saw is that um, we saw strong correlations with age, with deprivation, because this, needs, this survey also looked at um, multidimensional poverty, with urban, and with, with um, obesity. So this is obviously this is South Africa, mm, yeah. This is South Africa, and this this here represents the um, hotspots of multimorbidity, and this here represents the socioeconomic disadvantage across across the country. So you can start to see some clustering of multimorbidity and a deprivation. So yeah, so started thinking, well, how do we rethink strategies to improve population health equitably? Given what Alex meant, uh, presented earlier on the potential impact on, on the economic development, the, the one slide I didn't, uh, I realized I took out in the interest of time, is from that, from that study of multimorbidity that we looked at, we also looked at the patterns of multimorbidity across different age groups. And we saw that, again, even if you asked about, if you thought to think about blood pressure in, 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 a, in an infectious disease clinic, um, you wouldn't necessarily if a 30-year-old walks in. And what we saw actually was a high um, prevalence of multimorbidity in HIV-treated people in the 18 to 35. So this is really at an economically productive um, age group. We're not talking about, we're not talking about the uh, over 50s where we need to start thinking about it. We're actually seeing this multimorbidity happen at an age where we really can't afford, um, where we start to lose the advantage of the of the youth um, um, of youth part of the pop of the of the continent, I realized we couldn't really treat ourselves out of this epidemic. There was a paper recently uh, published by colleagues who l that looked at the cost of implementing primary care guidelines in South Africa for cardiovascular disease at 70% of what it should be. And in care level, we treated uh, cardiovascular disease at 70% of what we should, it would bankrupt the healthcare sector. We can't continue thinking just about catching up and treat. We have to treat the burden, sure. But who's thinking about, who's thinking about how to, to flatten that curve? Because we have to, we just simply have to. Given what we know that many of the factors that influence health lie outside of the health sector, how are we thinking about health creation beyond, um, beyond just the healthcare sector in order to address these inequities? This is Cape Town. This is Cape Town and this is Cape Town and this is Cape Town and this is Cape Town. Okay? So when we start thinking about I have, a, I have an S's of, ex of an exposure I think about, so I don't think about buildings. I think about ex exposures that influence health, whether that's sugar and salt in your food environment, whether it's um, sleep and stress and, and your um, smoke and smoking, whether it is your ability to exercise, um, access to um, physical activity, etc. But what we see what, is what we see playing out in Cape Town is not dissimilar what to what we see playing out in Rio, to what we see playing out in London, to different extents. But this notion that we have this cities within cities and where the exposures differ greatly. So when we start thinking about uh, addressing those um, determinants of health, we need to start thinking about uh, collecting data to inform that, but importantly, thinking about the, the kinds of data that we collect. I'll come back to that. I'll just move on to a different 
train of thought, which picks on the, my, um, my earlier narrative of moving outside of the, of the healthcare sector. So having kind of frustrated myself with sitting in the, in, in the clinic and doing clinical research, I started thinking about the determinants of, of health and how to incorporate things that I don't consider really part of my, my discipline or my sector, but seem to be pushing people to me. Um, I started thinking, well, if we were going to think about this differently, do we need to think differently about what constitutes a health service? So if we think about healthcare, which is where we normally are, right, and thinking about um, exposures, I'm an epidemiologist, so I think about exposures and outcomes. Um, think about exposure to healthcare services in terms of your dimensions of access, the intermediate outcomes which relate to really to the um, your interactions with the healthcare system and in, it really impacting your morbidity and mortality. But what if we thought about um, housing and habitation and planning as a health service? What if we thought about um, transport as a health service? What if we thought about waste and water and sanitation as a health service? Or food as a health service? And start thinking about the ways in which the components of those exposures impact on intermediate and long-term outcomes of health. And if we could conceptually think, rethink the notion of a health service and conceptually rethink what kinds of data that we need to start thinking about in terms of what your exposure is and how we measure the impact on health, then potentially we stand a chance at, at, um, at, at, at impacting, impacting prevention of, of these disease, diseases. Okay, thanks. So this was, is one of the approaches. So I hear a lot about precision medicine, precision medicine, and I, I don't know, I've got a different soapbox about that. But... Um, I think about precision public health in the context of really looking at, at the population level, um, collecting and harnessing data uh, to, in, a, in, in, a, in a disaggregated way to really highlight um, inequity and to inform how we prioritize interventions um, in, in the in context of the environment. So the third point, um, I'm gonna make three and four and five minutes apparently, um, <laughs> The third point was around health, the health governance. So this is a, these are three A's of health governance I'm testing out, right? So um, the, the image on the right is, is my uh, thinking around, so if you think about the, the, the slides I had on, on, on health, who, what the different health services are, that train of thought follows that then who the health professionals are, right? are more diverse than we, than we think, right? So can we think about not just the healthcare professionals or can we think about the planners and the engineers as health professionals because what they do impacts health? And can we bring that and integrate um, data and our thinking and align our, our, um, our outcomes for health outcomes and not just for the buildings? So I think about in terms of the actors, who are they? In terms of the agency, what is their landscape within which they operate and what agencies they have to work intersectorally in that way. And lastly, accountability. And this is something, we've got some um, on ongoing, ongoing research looking at health, integrating health in human settlements policies and um, in, in a couple of cities in, in the African context. And one of the key things we come across in terms of uh, um, talking to policymakers, one of the key barriers to to that integration is the accountability for health. Because in as much as I'm in housing and I know that what I do matters to health, what I'm accountable for is the number of houses I build, finish and clap, right? It's not about whether the house is, what the ventilation is, it's not about uh, whether I have uh, create, thought about the obesity and improved physical activity. It's not the accountability for health lies purely with the sector dealing with the outcomes of the health determinants, which is kind of something's broken along the way when you think about it that way. So this is my last slide. The, um, Mohammed, I think, presented on the need to uh, train, train and retain um, 
scientists um, in the in low income countries. I will add to that and say re train, retain, retrain, retain retrain <laughs> because the reality is and that was the comment that was made earlier on complexity science is that if we're not creating science environments that uh, a science environment that is responsive and is that enabling to support the kind of training and retraining for for impactful work we end up stuck and I was so frustrated about this, I wrote a, a commentary that I published in Nature about the importance of letting, of enabling scientists to pivot. Because, because the science environment actually is, 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 is very constrained. You, you start on one thing, how dare you move something else? This is what you do, you stay and do this. And so if we recognize that for science to impact on poverty, on inequality, um, on inequity, if we recognize that it's complex, it's shifting, and there are new skills that are coming up that we need to, we need to incorporate and evolve into, then the science environment itself has a lot to think about in thinking about how we support that, how we enable that, and we, don't, we do not inadvertently stifle that, um, that creativity. And this, Im this illustration, was just to remind um, me and therefore to remind you that often when I think about the science I do, I'm trying to achieve equitable public health, uh, population health outcomes. And we, of we often picture ourselves right over there, like I'm doing equals directly population outcomes. Whereas in reality, we work through, or whether that is um, uh, creating knowledge on um, policies, whether that's working through the individuals, whether that's working through communities, whether that's working through um, different, as different sectors, we create the knowledge uh, that has to be in order to implement, be implemented to create population health. We have to work with these different partners and the importance really of thinking about uh, the work that we do. I find myself working much more with uh, sitting in conferences with architects and planners, people I know whose languages I've had to learn to speak, because the reality is if I say that the work that you do matters for health, then I need to be in that space. And I think we need to recognize the importance of these atypical partnerships that will inevitably and should evolve if we are to um, embrace that complexity um, to, to address uh, poverty and inequity. So I think I'll stop there, thanks. I'll ask the other presenters to join us on the stage. We have some nice chairs and a, a nice glass of water for each of you. Um, I'll make a few changes to the usual way which we've done this. The first is to say to the presenters, could you each think of a question you'd like to ask each other? Because I know, of having been a presenter, I've often felt frustrated that I can't engage in a conversation when I've wanted to comment on those that are presenting with me. And then I've got A question for each of you. So Ramona, one, you commented a lot about the mega cities and the growth of the mega cities. Translation started. So you commented about the mega cities and the, and, and the role of transportation within mega cities. I'm not sure if this is the case in Latin America, but in sub-Saharan Africa, the, the fastest growth is going to occur in secondary cities. So I wondered, does that change scenarios if urban Problems, are, uh, problems of, of urban mobility have to be resolved in cities which are smaller, less well-resourced, what might be some of the issues? Um, Alex, so you took a very interesting line with your presentation, which made me think, well then, if this is how you're, how you're thinking about the problem of development, who actually has the problem? We're often told it's Africa that has the problem, but perhaps that's not the case. Perhaps the problem lies elsewhere, and could you comment on that? And lastly, Tola, you, you talked a lot about health, about um, physical health, but we know there's a connection between health and physical health and poverty. 
and there certainly is a connection between poverty and mental health. And perhaps could you talk a little bit about some aspects that are not that you ha didn't cover in your talk that relate to, me to, to mental health? So those are those questions. You've got to think something for you to ask each other, the ones that I've posed to you. Can we take three questions? Now, I'm unlike other chairs. I really don't like people making statements, and I will stop you. So please think what you're going to say and pose it as a question. Okay, so I'll give you each a moment. There's the first speaker. Well, thank you very much um, for this wonderful session. I really enjoyed all three presentations. I think they really brought some very interesting programs. But I have a question for the three of you. What would change in your analysis and whether you have considered if you take sex and gender into account? And I say very quickly why I say that. In case of transportation and mobility, there are very interesting works in Europe where they say that the pattern of men and women are completely different. But the way that women in Europe are attached to the uh, workspace, it's very different from those of Rio. So instead of having very short um, um, travel times as they have in Europe, perhaps women in Rio has as long travel times as men. So have you considered that? And how does that impact planning? For the very interesting um, um, talk on population, considering sex means that if you educate women, it is proved that immediately the, um, um, how do you say, taxa de natalidade, help me, um, birth rate immediately declines. So if Africa wants to reduce population growth, the main issue would be to educate women and to give them rights that would allow them to, to, to decide what to do about birth. And finally, about the very interesting talk about health and morbidity. Um, what does, if you consider gender influence on this, because naturally, if you think of housing or food, it is women that decide that in most families. Uh, influencing women will completely change. So please, could you comment on this? Okay. I try to follow your <laughs> guideline. Can I take one, another question in front? And then the last question must be in Portuguese. Thank you very much indeed, the presenter. I just have a very short question to Prof on transportation. Are you assuming that every person in transportation problems has got housing, food, water, and energy continuously, and therefore the biggest impediment of those people is actually transportation? And between the two colleagues, could you tell us where the headache of Africa continent appearing is lying about? Where exactly is the headache, the biggest hurdle of the two? Please take that one. Okay. And can we take the last question? And as I say, in the language of our host country, could you please point out who you're directing the question to so that I can give them the translation? Um, bom dia. Parabéns, ABC aos palestrantes e todas as palestras. Eu faço ao professor lá do COP, do COP, do COP, do COP. É o seguinte, para mim, na minha opinião, é, os juros, poupança e aplicação estão baixíssimos. A passagem está cara, o salário mínimo está baixo. Eu gostaria de saber é, se é, você acha a mesma coisa e... É, Aproveitando, eu, eu, eu que gostaria de saber lá na África se é lá essas aplicações que a pessoa coloca no banco o dinheiro e não rende quase nada, a passagem lá na África está cara, 
e o salário mínimo lá está caro ou está baixo? É isso que eu gostaria de saber. Parabéns, ABC, e parabéns a todos. Ok. If we can then start taking responses, could we start with you, Romulo? Bom, muito obrigado. É, as perguntas são realmente instigantes. É, eu vou responder todas. O... Bom, eu conheço pouco as cidades africanas. Eu tive alguns alunos africanos, estudamos algumas cidades, do Senegal, a Buja, a, não, tão, não tão diretamente do Senegal, bem, bem, bem mais perto. Mas é, eu, a minha, meu grande receio é que as cidades africanas, agora, ao crescerem muito, tenham o mesmo tipo de urbanização e piores problemas de transporte que temos agora. Então, acho que é um momento de repensar estrategicamente o sistema de mobilidade para ajudar, digamos assim, a reforçar essas multipolaridades. Eu vejo sob essa ótica. Eu conheço pouco, eu sei a história das cidades, a morfologia das cidades africanas difere das latino-americanas. As latino-americanas têm, têm características próprias, desde a presença espanhola ou portuguesa, mas, de qualquer forma, à medida que elas crescem, terminam tendo certas semelhanças. Né? A cidade do Cabo, a África do Sul, fez um conjunto de BRTs, uh, sobretudo a partir da Copa do Mundo, né? mas eu, eu, eu não, não saberia dizer se esses BRTs continuam ajudando a expansão física ou se ajudam a reorganizar o sistema de outra forma. Quanto às mulheres, eu fico muito feliz com a questão. É um dos primeiros estudos que eu, que eu li sobre esse assunto, das, das, das mulheres na cidade do Havre, em que os maridos iam trabalhar, elas assumiam toda a liderança do processo. Né? E as mulheres, eu costumo dizer que as mulheres no Brasil, as pobres, a minha filha diz que essa história de dizer que as mulheres passaram a trabalhar só agora, ela diz agora só as ricas, que as pobres sempre trabalharam. É, e é, eu te costumo sob uma forma um pouco, um pouco é, é, brincalhona, dizer que uma mulher, para pegar um ônibus no Brasil, ela tem que ter cinco mãos. Uma para levar o filho no colo, a outra para segurar, para não cair, a terceira para pagar, a quarta para pegar outra criança que ela não pode deixar em casa, e a cinco para limpar o menino que está doente e ela tem que tomar conta dele. É, eu acho que, é, a, de fato, as mulheres estão viajando mais, e em condições mais adversas. Eu não estou nem falando do aspecto do assédio, não estou nem falando do aspecto dessa insegurança. Novamente, a minha filha uma diz, disse eu, as mulheres têm que ter o direito de sair à noite sozinhas. Era o, que, o sonho dela, mulher não tem direito de sair à noite sozinha. Né? É, então, eu vejo, é, é, de fato, as mulheres estão trabalhando mais e, em, e, e nas viagens, elas têm uma diversidade maior. Nas classes médias, o carro fica com o marido, mas ela faz, tem que fazer um conjunto fantástico de viagens. Eu acho que a gente poderia ter é, políticas específicas de facilitar, não apenas a parte física de subir o ônibus, descer, que é absolutamente necessário, ah, mas talvez essa política de reordenamento do espaço venha ajudar um pouco isso, para diminuir essas viagens, o, o alcance delas, o, o desgaste que elas, que elas provocam. Ah, eu acredito que eu já respondi por segunda derivada, sua pergunta. E, de fato, o sistema de transporte no Brasil, transporte coletivo por ônibus, ele é caro. É caro. Ah, e tem subido muito mais, no meu entender, do que devia. E, e tarifa de ônibus foi uma das coisas que eu mais estudei na minha vida. Ah, ah, nós, é, é, se compararmos, por exemplo, as tarifas das cidades latino-americanas, a nossa é o dobro ou o triplo. Ah, em parte por essa rede mal organizada e ineficiente, e em parte por uma ausência completa de um sistema de controle que faça um reequilíbrio dos benefícios né, é, oferidos por esse sistema. Eu acho que nós precisamos, eu coloquei uma transparência muito rápida, em que eu falei que um dos, dos itens é o planejamento ruim, mas é também uma, uma, um sistema de, 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 de financiamento muito, muito adverso. Você pega países da Europa... Do ocidental, a, a, o investimento público em subsídio direto é muito forte. Por quê? 
porque, para a cidade como um todo, a existência desse sistema de transporte público é muito importante. Nenhum petrô do mundo se paga pelas tarifas que os usuários pagam. Nenhum. Mas se paga pela economia que ele procede, que ele permite a toda a economia urbana. É como um elevador e um prédio. Ninguém está pensando em cobrar para subir no elevador. Ninguém pensa em pagar pela escada rolante do shopping. Essa é a economia que lhe permite, que permite alguém ir a um dentista no 13º andar. Mesmo porque subir três escadas para sofrer, ninguém iria. Mas a, a existência do sistema de transporte é que viabiliza tudo isso. Então, todos aqueles que se beneficiam, ainda que não usem, eu acho que tem que contribuir, sim. E esta é o ponto central da política de mobilidade urbana hoje no mundo inteiro. Não vou me alongar mais, meus colegas, eu queria parabenizar. Eu encontrei uma, uma linha de similaridade, se me permitem a falta de modéstia, de me querer igualar, mas é que nós três questionamos as bases usuais das propostas. E eu fiquei muito feliz com isso. Just think how privileged you all are, because you're all wiser than I now. I do, the only, you know what happened, and I didn't. But I think you asked the question as well. Thank you. Max. Okay. Uh, thanks a lot. Um, I, in terms of in terms of your question, Julian, um, who has the problem of development? Um, I think we all do, Africa and the rest of the world. And the thing is for Africa to redefine what development means for it and what part to take. And that really will require local knowledge systems that will create alternative pathways uh, to development. Um, and I would take that to answer Professor Micheka's uh, question on uh, what's the biggest headache for Africa. I think it's been told what to do for 50 years or 60 years by the world. And, and what that means, I mean, think about it if you're a parent and you have a child at 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, you tell this child what to do. At 11, 12, you tell the child to do what to do. At 20, you're telling the child what to do. At 30, 40, you're telling the child what to do. There is a problem there. And the reason is this. Our governments have been incentivized to seek for knowledge from outside and undervalue local knowledge production. And we are funded to do research that no African government needs because the funding for research in Africa comes almost exclusively from outside, 50% of them in health. Let's get domestic investments into research, into thinking the solutions that we need for Africa and find out solutions that governments are putting resources into and investing in it. And then we might come up with something that is very different. I think the way we are looking at technology in Africa can actually increase the problem in Africa for the simple reason that if we become consumers of technology and not contributors to the development and design and the innovation that drives technology, we will end up where we were. We will, left behind, we will be left behind in many ways because it is not the ability to use the, te the technology that matters, it's your ability to design it, adapt it, and make it work for you and get the world to buy into it. And so you get uh, resources into it. I think I can't agree with you, Lady more on the issue of gender. And I did mention that in terms of how do you actually respond to the population challenge in Africa. Female education is one of the three things I mentioned there. And even the issue of family planning actually helps the women to move further away uh, from reproduction that keeps them shackled for years and, and all those. So for me, it is so critical. We cannot develop with just one gender and, and, and just the men. We have to have policies and programs that, uh, uh, that uh, recognize that and make the necessary investments. So female education is critical. But beyond that, you know, women get educated as children. And, and it takes 15 years, uh, 20 years to reap the benefits of that. In the immediate time, there are things we can do. Why is it that you can't vote at, until you're 18? You can't drink alcohol until you're 21 in many places, but you can get pregnant at 13 and 14 and 15 and it is okay. It is not okay. Do you want to pose your question? Okay. My question. Yes. So my question for you is really, I have a question for you. Uh, in terms of urban transportation, I worked for many years in the slums of Nairobi. And over the last 15 years, what we have noticed is that in 
injury as a cause of death has risen from 10% of the total death to about 40% for adults and is the leading cause of death for men. Increasingly for children, if you ask them their number one concern, it is being knocked down by vehicles going, while going to school in the morning. So we have transportation systems in Africa that are designed but have not taken into context the environment of the slums where these people are, and then you create roads and they are knocking people down. 80% of the deaths of tr from traffic accidents are pedestrians. They are not passengers, they are not drivers. So how do we actually design urban transportation systems that work for the poor in urban areas in Africa? And I think this is one of the challenges. And for you, you know, we injure, you, you pick the point that in uh, a lot of the solutions we need for health lie outside of the health. And injury death is one of those that it's not in the health sector, but it's a leading cause. And there's little or no programs addressing it. Under five mortality in the slums is driven by acute respiratory infections, which is due to the indoor air pollution and that the children are exposed to. Very little programs in those areas. How do we actually get these non-health sectors respond more effectively to the major change, changing patterns of disease in our, con in our context. Okay, Tola, can I move to you and then we'll come back to the, the question on urban transport. Okay, thanks. I'll, I'll come to that because um, it speaks to my last point. Uh, firstly, around mental health, um, Julian, I think you're absolutely right. The one, the one slide I didn't put on when I show the interaction between diseases and between exposures features mental health quite heavily on its own due to the stresses of the, expose, of the exposures in the urban context um, related to access, inequitable access to mental health care. Um, I read recently that uh, when you, if you use the indicator of mental, access to mental health care, every country is a developing country in the world. Um, uh, so that's always, a, it's always the one left behind. And also in, related, in relation to risk, of mental health with multimorbidity. So we also know in the context of chronic disease, having more than one increases your risk of mental health issues. So it's absolutely critical and cross-cutting. And not just, again, the, the youth dimension is an important one because we're seeing it manifest um, Ill he mental health in younger populations when you start looking for it. In response to the gender question, absolutely vital. Um, so if you look at... at we see we see the uh, we see the we see the downstream effects of gendered exposures happen quite early. So if you look at um, obesity in childhood, we see it diverge in in boys and girls around the age of 11. You start seeing uh, div divergence in, in in obesity. If you look at physical activity, there's an additional safety dimension that is very gendered in many urban contexts indoor air pollution, as you mentioned. And one of the things to highlight, which I didn't mention, is not just the individual health risk, but the added component, speci speaking specifically about women of reproductive age, is the intergenerational risk. So we know if you think about the life course approach, the health of the, of the mother significantly impacts not just the viability of the pregnancy and the health of the child, but actually the adult health. So your risk of cardiovascular disease is linked to the health of of the mother early on. So it's important to bear in mind is not just the gendered health here and now, but actually of the next generation. To come to the question around the biggest hurdle, I, I fully agree with what you, you mentioned, um, Alex. I would add to that two things, value and values. In other words, what do we value uh, and how do we show the ways in which we value it? So I think that's an important thing to go alongside what you say. And it is much as you, it's, it's like, Using your analogy of, 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 of children, you know, pe children start saying no to things before they really know what they want to say yes to. Um, and so at some point, if you don't know what it is that you want, you'll keep getting told what to do. Um, and what I see playing out in a lot of cities, we, 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 I don't see what it is, the statement on what it is that we value. Is the end point foreign direct investment, is that it? Because that is, what is, that is what is manifest. And the notion that, um, that health and equity will trickle down with wealth is a complete fallacy. 
So what is it that is at our core? What is it that we say we value? What, what, is it that, what are the resources that we value? And if it is the human resource that we say, in what ways do we, do we demonstrate it? If, in, if equity lies at the core of, of our values, in what ways are we demonstrating it? In what ways are our governance mechanisms, our policy structures, in what ways are those aligned to, that, to what we value and how we value it? And I think that is, that is often, often missing. And so um, that... Uh, speaks to, uh, yes, just to mention in terms of, and so addressing that needs rethinking how we govern for health, which is what, uh, which is what I alluded to. I had a recent, um, I wrote a recent commentary that got rejected and, and the comment was that, because uh, I was talking about thinking differently about governance for health across different um, sectors and intersectoral collaboration and thinking long term, long, long range about prevention. And the feedback was that uh, Africa has too many problems now to think about th that that is a luxury. I, I don't even know what to do with that. You know, the, the notion that in, uh, innovative governance for, to think long term about reducing the burden of disease in the long term is, is a luxury, is just one. And that's what happens when when you don't when you don't put forward what it is that you value, and I think the last thing that we hasn't we haven't um, mentioned, but it is important. Um, I think Mohammed mentioned it briefly. Is is the training and how we train the edu in the education system from very early on, and I think that speaks to values. Until we change the ways that we manifest and we show how we value teachers, we will not get the best people teaching. And if we don't get the best people teaching, then we don't. We can talk about the education system and, and, and rethinking it, creative thinking, et cetera. But if we don't, if we, if as a society don't value teachers, we don't get the best people teaching. Could we, could we go back to Ramona to answer the one question that you've got outstanding? Uh. Sem dúvida, eu acho que parte da resposta você deu ao trazer a sua proposta sobre como a África deve olhar o seu desenvolvimento. Uh, sem, existem muitas tecnologias que se adequariam a situações adversas da topografia, onde uma parte das favelas, aqui nós até já estamos chamando de comunidades, é, é, se situa. Outras não têm esse problema específico de ter escarpa a 20, 30 metros, mas, ainda assim, tem ruas estreitas, ruas mal, mal urbanizadas. Nós temos um exemplo não muito grande, em Belo Horizonte, em que se redesenhou uma rede local de transporte coletivo de pequeno porte, que pode atender e faz círculo de viagens curtas, levando até uma, uma, uma avenida mais larga, onde os sistemas mais, mais fortes podem, podem utilizar. Mas a variedade de soluções é grande, depende da topografia, depende da urbanização desses lugares, que sejam os cabos, uh, nós chamamos de uh, cabos, né? que, pendurados, esqueci o nome em inglês, até em português, eu esqueci o nome, né? os bondinhos, como nós chamamos aqui. É, é uma das possíveis soluções, porque não escada rolante, por que não escada rolante? É, nós temos várias soluções. Eu acho que a razão central é, ela vem novamente do âmbito maior, do âmbito político, que eu vou ligar com a parte de acidentes. A quantidade de acidentes em automóveis no Brasil, automóveis, rodovias, equivale a cair um avião todas as semanas. Só que o efeito... Public, é, 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 o contraste disso na, no imaginário das pessoas é completamente diferente. Nós temos aqui, morrem três ou quatro vezes mais do que os americanos perderam em toda a guerra do Vietnã. Então, é um dos países que tem mais alta taxa de mortes em acidentes de trânsito. Eu não encontrei ali, procurei na África, nos, na sua lista, ali, as mortes decorrentes de África, mas acho que não, não foi seu objeto ali de, 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 de análise. Na nossa, é muito grande. E está se agravando com a expansão das motocicletas. Nós usamos na, no, no segmento uma linguagem, a vietnamização, porque a quantidade de motocicletas e os acidentes que percorrem em cima disso. Eu diria que, justamente porque são as camadas mais pobres, as, os dirigentes que não têm esse olhar democrático, social, importante, não enxergam, não veem. Quando não se faz uma prioridade para o transporte por ônibus, na verdade, não está se enxergando que ali dentro 
tem 50, 70 pessoas, todas elas pobres. Então, acho que a questão central está principalmente em colocar o transporte público como na política, na agenda política principal, e não apenas na agenda política setorial. Right, I would have loved to have taken more questions. I already was hoping to get some questions from some students in the room, but I think we have run out of time. I stole some of your lunch time because we ran over time. So, firstly, can we thank our presenters? I think they did a great job. And then I'll ask Marcus to tell us housekeeping details and where, where we found our lunch.